باللغة الإنجليزية ولا باللغة الدراسية ولا باللغة الدراسية؟ لا 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 السلام عليكم نسكروا الباب التاني نسكروا الباب التاني هشام نسكروا الباب التاني قول شكون برا ما تطلعش وليت في لونفيس طيب هذه ما تخدمش يا وين لونفيس سي سامي هكا سي سامي قول لي تو بريك سامحني قلت له Bonjour tout le monde. Bonjour tout le monde. Good morning everyone. It's a big pleasure for me to welcome all of you here in Tunisia, in Tunis, the capital, and in Institut Pasteur de Tunis, a more than one century institute. And I'm here for just five minutes to present the campaign. So this campaign is done in the frame of the working group health and society activities, which is one of the groups of the ARB Germany and Academy of Sciences and Humanities, with the collaboration and help of my colleagues and friends, members from Palestine, Egypt, Jordan, Oman, Germany, Libya, Lebanon, and Emirates. So today we will start, it's a campaign that will last for two days. We will start by a list of conferences here to tackle the uh, antibiotic resistance from different angles. We will speak about the impact on human uh, health and vet, and we will uh, provide or show some alternatives to the use of antibiotics. Of course, all these conferences will be on real time broadcast on the channel tube of Institute Pasteur de Tunis. After taking your lunch, and I hope it will be very tasty, we will move, but only 10 participants to the workshop for lab visit school, uh, school students. They will be familiar to uh, microbiology, culture of bacteria, Antibiogram, they will see bacteria using a microscope. And to that regard, I would like to thank my colleagues, 
mainly Dr. Awad Bjewi and Dr. Ahlem Djouini under the head of uh, Dr. Abdelzeq Arufi in the group of uh, bacteriology and biotechnological development who will host their, uh, this visit in their lab and will organize all the necessary hands-on on training. Tomorrow we will continue the campaign, but not in Institut Pasteur. We will move, but in a limited number, to the hospital. And we have chosen to do this in the children's hospital in Tunis, Bashir Hamza. First, we will offer 300 kits for allergy kits for three, uh, 300 patients. The idea behind this is to do a differential diagnosis of what we call allergic bronchitis between all the group of uh, bronchitis due to uh, infectious disease, and these need really uh, antibiotics to be treated. And this is done, of course, with the help of uh, the head of the lab, the Department of Allergology and Pediatric de this Department in uh, this hospital. We will also distribute toys and thank to Ziyed, this is his idea, our original coordinator and idea of his wife, let's say. <laughs> and uh, we will also do questions. We will question the families and we will use a questionnaire that we adapted from the one developed by the WHO. We adapted it to the Arab uh, countries context. So the questionnaire it will be about demographics and the main question about the use of antibiotics what is uh, the knowledge about antibiotics and antibiotic resistance? And this will be done in the hotel. And I remember the IGA members that they have to work here in Tunis. So we will meet in the afternoon to work on the questionnaire. And I would like to thank Dr. Tarak Osayli from Emirates, Dr. Suhir Sinokrat from Jordan, who worked really very hard to get the approval, the ethical approval from the IRB Institute in Jordan for this uh, study. I would like to thank Dr. Shadi Barkouni and Dr. Mushtaba Ali Insani from Germany, who worked to launch this uh, uh, questionnaire and this survey on Qualtrics. So next week, I think we will do the testing phase and inshallah in the course of the next month, we will distribute it with you so you can fill the questionnaire. And of course, as an outcome of this campaign, we will have results of this uh, questionnaire will be summarized in a scientific paper and of course, with the help of our photographer and video producer, we will summarize all the event and produce a video, which will be posted on the Agia website, Shala Hasur, and the IPT website also. And we will prepare a brochure, which, is, which will summarize the key message learned from this campaign. And to that regard, I would like also to invite all of you, if you have a code, anything, any idea, any uh, 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 suggestion to add, you can, of course, share it with us. And at the end, I would like to thank the organizing committee, mainly Ziyad Bayer, who is our Agia Regional Coordinator for the Maghreb, for his valuable help. And also thank very much Monsieur Hisham Bin Hussein, our communication manager, for his valuable help in putting this online, in announcing the event. And I would like also to thank the members of the group of Bacteriology and Biotechnological Development for their help in inviting speakers and in hosting the workshop in their lab. And thank you all for being here, and I wish you a nice event. And before giving the lecture, the, the mic to the first lecture, I would like to invite our Director General, Professor Heshmi Luzir, to give you a, a welcome message. Thank you, Sir Heshmi. Thank you very much, uh, Olfa, and I want to thank you also for the organization of this uh, interesting workshop. Sabah al khir, wa marhaba bi zuyuf. Uh, I feel very much honored to welcome you here in Tunisia in this context of the, this uh, subject, which is very, very interesting and emerging subject in terms of public health antibiotic resistance within the frame of Arab German Young Academy of Science and Humanities. This workshop came just after COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, we hope that uh, we are at the end of this uh, pandemic, uh, and uh, I think that uh, uh, it's it's very pertinent. And so the subject is is one of the most important priority in terms of public health uh, in the world. WHO, the network of the different institution, research institution, and it will be probably the one of the most problem in the future in terms of public health. Uh, this workshop uh, uh, will promote scientific cooperation uh, with, uh, uh, with in, in 
the objective to build sustainable long-term international collaboration. And this is something, I think, very important for our region. And we have to promote this kind of activities. And uh, this morning, I, I, I met one of uh, an old colleague that we met many, many years ago. And I'm very happy to find him here. Uh, he come from uh, El Quds University. Welcome to all of you. The ultimate propose uh, uh, through real example to identify, I think, strengths, uh, the weakness, uh, the gap, and to try to find probably opportunities to build research program uh, in in this field of, of antibiotic uh, resistance. Uh, just a few words uh, in our institution, Institut Pasteur. Is, is, is one of the most important, I think, research institution in, 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 in Tunisia, uh, the first in, in terms of uh, health and also in the region, in the MENA region. We have, uh, 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 let's say, three main missions. One is uh, dedicated to uh, analysis and public health activities with the link with the Ministry of Health, uh, with this uh, reference labs and with some uh, reference for the region as you know, we belong to the EMO region, so this is one of the most important <coughs> objectives and activities. The second, uh, and I think it's the first in terms of, of, uh, uh, of the scientists and in terms of uh, uh, personnel uh, that are involved in this activity, is research activities. Research and training also, because Institut Pasteur belong to uh, the first university in Tunisia, it's, which is University of Tunis and Manar. So uh, this research activity is developed in 10 research labs that are supported by uh, the Tunisian Ministry of Health and, and uh, Scientific... Uh, no, it's the Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research that pay, that uh, support the labs, but also uh, we are involved in different uh, collaborative programs between different uh, Tunisia and other countries, and especially some programs that are supported by uh, the National Institute of Health, for example, Welcome Trust, uh, the European Union, etc., that involve many, many other, uh, let's say, institutions and, and scientists. Uh, the other activities is the manufacturing of uh, some vaccine and therapeutic serum that are made in SFU Pasteur in Tunis, especially BCG vaccine and serum against scorpions, against uh, vipera and anti-rabies, anti-serum that are that save life, uh, that kind of serum. So finally, I would like to thank the organizers and uh, uh, Olfa Masoud, uh, uh, that uh, we already discussed the content of the, of the program, and uh, really I want to thank you, Olga, for this uh, organization or your, and your involvement in this academy of uh, young uh, scientists, uh, Arab German young scientists. <clears throat> While you are here, and especially for those who come from outside Tunisia, uh, I strongly recommend you to spend a few days in science sitting and i wish the workshop a complete success thank you for your attention thank you very much thank you so much Hajmi. sorry i forgot to mention and to thank dr maha nasser for her involvement sorry maha in brainstorming and in writing the draft the proposal of this and to thank from germany henry who is uh, watching us by cam uh, for his uh, deep involvement, involvement in uh, this uh, event. And thank you all. And without uh, delay, I would like to welcome Dr. Asma Firjani, who comes from the Sharnikol Hospital in Tunis to give the first lecture. Uh, bonjour. Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Asma Firjani. I'm uh, Associate Professor in Microbiology this uh, exercise in uh, uh, Medicine University and uh, 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 Charnicol Hospital in Tunis. It's a great pleasure to be with you this morning, and I want to thank the organizers of this event for inviting me and giving me uh, this opportunity. <coughs> so,
So it's a, a great opportunity to speak about antibiotic resistance in Tunisia, the current situation. Elasticates antibiotic resistance uh, has increased at an emerging rate, and uh, today it represents a major global public health concern. Put in question the validity and the therapeutic arsenal. This is a serious threat, not only in hospital, but always also, sorry, in the community. Generating an increased morbidity and mortality and additional cost due to longer hospitalizations and the overload of care. Antibiotics have changed the, uh, the history of medicine, of human medicine. Several molecules have been appeared, and uh, unfortunately, antibiotic resistance has threatened the effectiveness of these antibiotics. And uh, uh, so uh, there is a resistance uh, which appear, appeared in just a few years after the appearance of uh, these uh, molecules. Antimicrobial resistance has dangerously reached high levels of resistance in all the regions of the world. And uh, it represents, it does, currently represents uh, about so 700,000 of, it causes 700,000 of deaths uh, according to the last reports of WHO. And if we don't take, uh, uh, if we don't act uh, immediately together now, this uh, threat will be the, the first cause of deaths in 2050. So, so if we don't act together now, no treatment tomorrow. Some definitions are needed to better uh, perform a better comprehension of uh, antibiotic resistance. We have two types of uh, antibiotic resistance. Natural antibiotic resistance, considered as an identification criteria, and define the wild phenotype and the activity spectrum of antibiotics and acquired antibiotic resistance define uh, acquired phenotype and it represents epidemiological marker. An international panel of experts has developed the following definitions. What we call multi-drug resistance bacteria are bacteria resistant to at least one agent for three or more families of antibiotics. Extremely drug-resistant bacteria are resistant to all tested antibiotics except one or two. And pan-drug-resistant bacteria are resistant to, to all antibiotics tested. The persistence and the spread of antibiotic resistance are globally due to to uh, two factors, the selective pressure affecting commercial and infectious sites flora, and the transmission of resistance, which can be through the transmission of the whole resistant bacteria or the transmission of the resistance genes. This uh, alarming phenomenon is due on one hand, uh, on one hand, on uh, to over and inappropriate use of antibiotics, and on the other hand, to the lack of best practices of infections control. That's me, the lack of hygiene. Now, the promiscuity between human and animals, as well as the ease of movement affect the transmission of resistance in human medicine, veterinary medicine, and as well as in the environment. This justifies an intersectorial and an interministerial action or, or approach according to one world, one health concept. 
antibiotic resistance, which is reaching and touching, uh, reaching high levels and all regions of the world. These levels are changing from one country to another country according to pathogens, antibiotic prescription practices, and hygiene practices. According to my last research, we have about 38,000 publications on multidrug resistance bacteria now. Among them, we have 10,000 publications on ESBN and about 8,000 on carbapanemasis and 2,000 about XDL, but only less than 500 publication, uh, Tunisian publications. The question was, and still remains, how to proceed against, to fight against this, uh, uh, this threat. And in this fight, an, a tripolar collaboration between WHO, FAO, and OIE was established. And it aims to improve awareness and understanding of the phenomenon of antimicrobial resistance to strengthen surveillance and research, and to optimize the use of antibiotics. Since January 2015, the Minister of Health in Tunisia has created a technical committee for the fight against antibiotic resistance and, uh, it, uh, and has established a national action plan. According to One Health approach, and the following four principal uh, axes. Uh, the first is education, training, and awareness. The second is antibiotics, surveillance, and research. The third is infections prevention and control. And the last is surveillance, optimization of, uh, and optimization of the antibiotic consumption. Our laboratory in Charnikol Hospital represents the focal point of antibiotic resistance surveillance and research and is representing ACTS 2 We are working in close collaboration with the regional office of WHO, the local office of WHO, and the collaboration center of WHO, uh, Robert Koch Institute in Germany. Tunisia has its uh, own monitoring network since 1999. It's called on l'antibio resistance en Tunisie ou l'ART. It is continuously collecting detailed and comparative data, giving and giving regular and updated publication and also updated reports. At the beginning in the 2017 and uh, before 2017, these reports were uh, published in, uh, in small uh, booklets, but since 2011, we can consult them on the Tunisian Society of Infection Pathology website. We have eight university centers uh, from uh, which we can undertake this uh, data. Uh, and these uh, uh, centers, uh, participating centers, uh, are following the same methods of uh, collect. On the other hand, Tunisia joined the International Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance Network, called GLASS, which is a WHO network, in May 2016. In the first years, uh, the, the, the reports were sent send directly from the focal point from our laboratory to WHO uh, 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 site. So there isn't uh, uh, an intermediate center. But since 2020, the surveillance system has included 11 monitoring sites which were sending their data to our point, uh, focal point 
for uh, to be validated and resend them again to Unity of Laboratory in uh, the Ministry of Health. If, uh, from this uh, National Coordinator Center, the results will be addressed to GLASS, to the site of GLASS. Now we'll talk about the results, our data, our national data on antibiotic resistance surveys. National data show that multidrug resistance bacteria are represented essentially by gram-negative bacilli, which were following an endemic way with occasional epidemic outbreaks, mainly in intensive care, surgery, and neonatology departments. First of all, they were in hospitals, but then they were reported in the community, but unfortunately we haven't precise data from the community. Klebsiella pneumonia represents the most gram-negative bacteria in gram-negative bacilli. And as we can see here, the uh, evolution of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, resistance rates of this bacteria shows that uh, now we have uh, about half of strains which were resistant to third generation cephalospory, and we have about 20% of resistance to carbapenems. So one strain, on dit en français, une souche sur deux, half strains are uh, resistant to third generation cephalosporins. It is an alarming rate. And among this carbapenem resistance Klebsiella pneumoniae, we see that there are two antibiotics which, which are effective on these uh, strains, multidrug resistant strains. But even with TGCCLI, we have 15% of resistance. Now, for E. coli, as we can see here in this slide, we have also a quarter of strains which were resistant to fluoroquinolones, and about 18% of strains resistant to third generation cephalosporins. The other antibiotic resistant rates on carbapenem resistant E. coli are high, but lower than rates of Klebsiella pneumonia. We have only 9% of resistance to amikacin and 14% of resistance to TGCP, and only two strains which were resistant to colistin. Now, from, uh, for cloacae, we, uh, we have also 26% of resistance to third generation cephalosporins, but less than 8% of resistance to carbapenem, and less than 3% of resistance to imipenem. So we have 77 uh, 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 resistance uh, resistance strains to ertapenem, but less than three percent of resistance to imipenem. But for the other antibiotics, we can see here high levels of resistance to this kind of multidrug resistant bacteria. So just we have uh, the mo the most effective antibiotic is colistin. What about now Pseudomonas aeruginosa? The annual evolution of imipenem resistance rates shows that there isn't a great, a big difference between rates, uh, between years, and uh, we are 
less than 30% 30 30 of resistance. The distribution of imipenem resistant to demonus aeruginal strains according to the different departments shows that intensive care unit represents the most affected department, and this is a usual situation since this bacteria is a hospital bacteria. There is high levels of resistance also to this uh, imipenem resistant strains. And uh, we are, uh, even with cholestine, we have 11% of resistance. Now, what about Asintobacter bomani? With this bacteria, we were and uh, never are with reasonable rates. And uh, rates reach, we are, we are reaching 85% uh, of uh, resistance to imipenem while the resistance to cholestine oscillated between 3 and 4 percent. So ESBL production affected essentially Klebsiella pneumonia, cloacae, and E. coli, while carbapenemases production uh, uh, showed essentially on Bomani, XDL Bomani, XDL Aluginosa, and Carbapenemases. We are worried about a phenomenon which is the spread of cholestin resistant strains, essentially among Klebsiella pneumonia and Asintobacter bomani XD. And since 80, uh, 90, uh, 20, uh, sorry, 20 and 19, we have an emerging strains of uh, strains harboring MCR1 genes in human uh, medicine. But uh, since uh, twen uh, nine, uh, 20 and uh, uh, 15 in veterinary medicine. For COXI, uh, positive gram uh, COXI, we have uh, uh, a, a constant level of resistance, less than 18%. And PDSB and uh, von commission resistant fissure are also increasing. Fissure represents now a huge MDR, essentially in hospital. And we have alarming rates of resistance. We have reaching 80, 84% to ampicillin, 66% to genitrab, missing with high level of resistance, and 26% of resistance to vancomycin. And unfortunately, we haven't a great choice of antibiotic, antibiotics, so we haven't uh, antibiotics effective on this uh, kind of this uh, MGA, we have uh, less than 10% of uh, sensitivity to gentamicin. We, can it, we, can, uh, we can't use it. And uh, we have 70% of resistance to linezolid. For the gentamicin resistance strains, we have always high <coughs> levels of resistance, and uh, even with linezolid, we have eight, about 9% of resistance. For uh, streptococcus pneumonia, we have high levels of resistance on, uh, for penicillin, reaching 68%, and 42% to amoxicillin, but less than 6% to third generation cephalosporin. But we haven't noted difference between these rates, between invasive and non-invasive states. This slide show us the distribution of multidrug resistant bacteria isolated from blood in the Eastern Mediterranean region. And uh, as we can see here, 
the most uh, affected uh, regions are Egypt, Tunisia, Saudi Arabia, and Pakistan. Our surveillance system has strengths such as multi center studies standardized since 1999 with reliable data and involved identification of uh, and identification of involved mechanisms. However, there isn't uh, uh, community data, and the data uh, aren't representative of the whole country because we have just eight. Uh, eight centers, uh, eight participating centers. Now, what about our future plans? We would like to widen LART, to upgrade laboratories and detecting new resistant mechanisms, improving infection prevention controls measures, to implement programs of surveillance of antimicrobial consumption and uh, Diagnosis antimicrobial susceptibility management programs. And finally, I would like to say we may not be able to stop the emergence of superbugs, but we can stop the spread. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Asma, for this presentation. And I think you have uh, uh, told us two few words about the national plan. And uh, I see the opportunity to tell you that, uh, unfortunately, due to some emergency related to uh, an accident in her pregnancy, Dr. Salma Zargouni, which is announced, who is announced in uh, the program, can't join us. So fortunately, you said few words about this national plan. So you have listened to two conferences instead of one. That's it. So we move now to the second lecture. And yes. And I would like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Mohamed Hadidi from Egypt. Yes, please. On the user. We will leave the questions to the, after this speech, okay, for the two speech. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is uh, Mohamed Hadidi, and I work as a full professor in the World City for Science and Technology in Egypt. Um, I joined the World City since four years ago, and I just want to introduce my work in Egypt four years as a PI. Uh, yet, they may be all fi and like a singer called Abd Halim Hafiz. He's saying, if you want to start the story, just did it from the beginning. So, now it's not okay. I will him the day. So, so I want to start like from the early beginning of uh, my research about like maybe 38 years ago. Uh, my father's died uh, of hepatitis C infection, which was really endemic in Egypt, and it was sad. And maybe this is one of the secrets why I joined microbiology to make an impact in my country. Uh, yet, if you want to see the history of HCV in Egypt, um, it was like you know, like Egypt was making like a campaign at the campaign we are doing now for schistosoma, Gerber harissia, and uh, instead of like you know sterilizing the syringes, they are using the same syringe for sterilizing everyone. So everyone got infected with. Oh, come ahead, come. Uh, everyone got infected with SCV, including my father. So that's why I, I made a quote: If you want, like you know, you are fight like you are creating like a hero, then you created a monster. Or what we say in Egypt, badal uh, ameha. So you know it. <laughs> so that's what uh, in Egypt, like you know, we created the monster out of the hero. And if you see like about the philosophy of antibiotic resistance, you will feel also the same. Since Alexander Fleming uh, actually invented the penicillin as one of the best antibiotics, and they saw like we will save all the lives uh, in 1928, and since then, you know, we are suffering now from a superbugs. And what I meant by a superbug, that like a, like you know, like a bacteria can be a pain resistant to all antibiotics. So that's a serious problem. What happened in the like the past hundred years? 
to make like one of the most important inventions in the history of industry, which is antibiotics now, is like a cotton candy. You take an antibiotic and there is no effect anymore. So that's my area of research. I'm working on antimicrobial evolution of different bacterial bugs. Um, it's the city for science and technology. Uh, I think as my actually mentioned like the timeline of like the antimicrobial resistance. So I will skip this slide. But as I said, like, you know, I was talking about a timeline of like a decade or hundred years about like this evolution. I'm actually really interested in studying the evolution. And I'm also telling my students, if you want to start evolution or study evolution, just try with the bugs, you know, the bugs, you can see the evolution because the bacteria can grow like in one day, you know, so you can see the evolution over the population. So I'm studying the evolution over the population. I spend like days and nights studying this type of evolution with my students and my team. And I want to give you like an insight about our research, I hope. Um, uh, uh, okay, so uh, I also want to highlight about the One Health uh, concept. I think Salma uh, will mention the One Health concept, like, you know, that we are kind of interconnected. Like, if you only, also ban, like, the antimicrobial prescription in the pharmacies, would it, like, affect or help with the antimicrobial resistance? The answer is no. I'm a veterinarian, so I know that, like, you know, like, the One Health concept, how, like, how, like, using antibiotics in the form can actually affect our antibiotic uh, resistance. So these are one of the most enormous papers on uh, one health aspect and like finding the antimicrobial resistance that we encounter at the animal uh, or in the farms as well. Um, so uh, as you know, like, you know, as I'm a veterinarian, I'm also advocate of like, you know, zoonotic diseases and one like 75% of all the bugs we encounter, the, the origin actually is like animals. So, you know, you have to have like such kind of approach, which we call the one health or from farm to fork, you know, you can get like the evolution, you study the evolution, you don't study the evolution at the like, late and part in the host you have to study the evolution at the early part from the farm because we eat this food and like you know bugs are evolving everywhere and also antibiotic resistance is like one of the cross borders you know what the cross border of trans boundaries like you know like we can eat something in india and you can get back and that's what actually happened you know like someone eat like something uh, in india and we got like one of the most important antimicrobial resistant genes and they named it like new delhi metallobital activity like you know this is a source india was you know supposed to be the source of this resistant gene. So this is a transboundary problem. And like, you know, even closing the borders won't help. And actually we found this in COVID-19 as well, one of the transboundary uh, infections. Uh, so I'm um, also for research funding. If like, you know, uh, any of here like our research funders, I think we are uh, like investing a lot in cancer research. And I would say like by 2050, you know, simply uh, a baby will be dying from diarrhea, you know, like just like, you know, from like breastfeeding or so, because we don't have like any kind of intervention or research on antibiotic resistance. So uh, our research, uh, like, as I said, like since 20 years ago, since I like, I'm officially like, I'm a microbiologist, uh, I was doing like the ordinary stuff, like, you know, just doing a molecular characterization of bugs and like, you know, doing like making colonies, doing the PCR and like, you know, screening for the, the resistant genes by just like a normal Sanger sequencing and PCR amplification. And I think guys, you are doing the same. Uh, and like to study that population structure and what I mean, I mean by population structure always like, you know, if I want to categorize all this group, you know, I have to categorize maybe by nationality. I would say like, who is Egyptian here? And like someone will raise this hand. So these are the group, uh, a clone who is Tunisian here and probably most of you are Tunisian. So it'd be a big clone who is like Lebanese here. And this is like what we call in the evolution a population structure. So we need like also to identify bacteria by the population in order to study the evolution. And one of the most gold standards are called multi locus sequence typing. You just like, you know, out of, let's say, 1.6 uh, million best pair in here, uh, which is uh, the genome of, of like, you know, a Campylobacter, you screen like 0.2%. You just like do seven genes and you just screen it by PCR and sequencing. That was nice, but I think in the era of next generation sequencing, it will not be valid anymore. So we are implementing next generation sequencing, or what we mean like high throughput technology at the world city in Egypt in order to investigate the evolution of different bacterial bugs in a higher resolution and in depth, okay? And different questions, actually, if you want here to screen antibiotic uh, genetic elements and population structure, yet we are going really in depth and to study different uh, research question and hypothesis regarding the evolution of antimicrobial resistance, the ecology, the core genome and the pan genome, and I'll investigate like what are the core genome, the source attribution analysis with next generation sequence, you can say, hey, like, the source of this antibiotic resistant gene is probably like eating some chicken from the local market or like, you know, eating some uh, meat, something like this. And we are doing also genome-wide association studies. And I think we are also doing a good job in uh, GWAS analysis. 
So uh, 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 this figure in the bottom is actually the pipelines are using, you know. We are doing the next generation sequencing and we assemble the genome by spades and these are the pipelines. And these pipelines, you can get it from the GitHub. Like, you know, you are doing ProCA for like predicting the functions of the different uh, proteins. We are doing uh, in silico typing. We are doing the micro act in order to make some kind of fancy trees that see, you will see now. We are doing the abricate the card and these types of platforms in order to investigate the antibiotic resistant genes. We are doing the structure, which is really a nice one of the like very good like uh, bioinformatic and analysis pipeline. It, it can actually see like allelic frequencies in order to investigate what are the source. So veterinarian would really like this uh, platform. And we're also doing scoring, which is like a GWAS analysis. So here are the different in questions. You need to study the evolution. So you can do some kind of like phylogenetic analysis uh, in here. Uh, so you can actually, I'm sure if I saw this, it's fine. Uh, you can do a phylogenetic analysis either based on the core genome. Let's say like we are doing the multi based on seven genes. The core genome are like, you know, you are screening for hundreds of genes. Can you imagine like the, the resolution power or like the difference in the resolution power between screening like, 100 genes and only seven genes, which are like 0.2% of the whole bacterial genome. So here, is, here we go. Uh, we are also investigating, as I said, the core genes. We are actually like doing some kind of comparative and global uh, co comparative genomics between our isolates in Egypt and like, you know, the global isolates. Let's say like we are comparing uh, between our isolates and the Oxford data sets in, in UK or in Tunisia. And that's what we actually did. Um, we are also like to investigate, we know that, hey, like in bacteria evolution is created by either by like mutations and like single nucleotide polymorphism or by a combination like horizontal gene transfer. So in, by in silico screening of the recombination hotspots, we can screen, this is our one of the recombination hotspots that are prone to horizontal uh, gene transfer. As I mentioned, like the picture in the bottom was actually like the pipelines are doing in different bugs. We are using the MRSA, we are using the Inflexial anemone, we are using the Acinetobacter bubinii, we are using the Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and we are very, doing very good model in Campylobacter, one of my favorite bugs. Uh, so these are, uh, these are one of our recent publications, which was published last, last year, as I mentioned, about uh, using the structure, which is like one of the nice softwares you can doing some kind of association between allelic frequencies of different like, you know, sources of infection, and uh, like you know, it can predict what are the sources of, of infection. Like it's, it's like an amazing one. So we conducted a pilot study uh, using uh, Campylobacter as a model. And we actually, these are like, uh, like one of the discrimination powers of different genotypic methods that we use. It might be used as a genetic, a genetic signatures to predict the structure. And these are uh, our like results. Like, hey, it's, it's pretty simple. Like let's say the blue is like, uh, is predicting that uh, retail chicken is the source of antibiotic resistant Campylobacter and the beige is like chrominance. Uh, also, these are one of the typical like, you know, minimum spanning tree. I think you are always using this minimum spanning tree to in order to investigate the evolution. These are also one of our least in publication like published last year uh, about using the high throughput technology in order to investigate uh, like the population structure of antimicrobial resistance. And as you can see, like in this tree, like it's different clades and what we saw that the uh, homogeneous resistance among different clades of Campylobacter. Uh, as I mentioned, like in, uh, in comparative genomics, you are only we, we, like, uh, 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 like, you know, as a microbiologist, like lesson one in antibiotic resistance is just like act local, but have a vision global. So you act at the local context in Egypt, but you have to comp like have a vision of the global because we mentioned about this one health and transboundary infection. So uh, we compared actually our isolates with uh, Oxford datasets and our collaborators in the UK in order to investigate the difference in the clonal population structure between the Egyptian datasets and uh, the UK datasets. And our hypothesis here is a selective pressure of using antibiotics in Egypt everywhere can be like a selective pressure for selective antimicrobial resistance traits. Uh, these are our pan genome uh, by Rory. Um, and like the figure, which is like the red and blue, mainly like that it, it seems like the antibiotic resistance is like at the phenotypic level is much more higher than the Oxford data sets. Uh, these are one of like, I, I don't have actually like, you know, I, don't, I'm, I know that I'm really limited in time, but if you want to like to chat with me anytime about these pipelines, like feel free. This uh, pipeline is called PopCon Pop or Pyrate, uh, and you actually can screen by like average nucleotide identity between the accessory genome and the core genome. And like our conclusion is, okay, like Egyptian data sets as compared to the Oxford data sets are sharing more accessory genome and it's more prone to horizontal gene transfer. And this is one of the mechanisms why Egypt as a, like, let's say like a developing country 
is like the antibiotic resistance is more evident than one of the countries uh, in our comparison group, which is the offshore data sets in the UK. Um, uh, finally, like this is are the genomic part. And as I said, like my presentation is a genomic part and uh, an applied part or the fundamental part and applied part. These are also one of the, my, our recent publication last year about using uh, one of the mechanisms that are very rarely investigated uh, is the toxin antitoxin system, one of the major mechanisms of antimicrobiotic resistance by bacteria. And this is an in silico work we have done on uh, these bugs. I compile a bug as a model and we investigated 10, 10 novel uh, toxin antitoxin systems in our uh, bacterial bugs. Uh, so this is uh, actually the, the fundamental research part about the fun, like the, how using like uh, high throughput technology in order to investigate or like have a better understanding of the bacterial evolution. Yet uh, maybe uh, this research is just like I, I literally brought it from the oven and every day I'm just like tweaking my students to send me the slides and so uh, these are like maybe like less than two or three months ago. It's like a collaboration with Dr. Maha, Maha Nas. Um, as I said, like one of the most like, you know, pro cones of our research that it's a basic fundamental research. So we need to move this forward into an applied research. And we collaborated with Dr. Maha Anas about biofilm formation. And biofilm formation is actually one of the most important or crucial elements of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Bacteria can like, you know, like encounter like some kind of colonies and then they have an exopolysaccharide. And with this exopolysaccharide, the antibiotics can't actually penetrate this structure see if you want to study like the biology we want first to investigate the biology of the biofilm okay and the biology is biofilm we know that bacteria can like certain densities can have like some kind of signaling molecules and what i mean by signaling molecules here by gram negative bacteria is ahl a called a hemosherine lactone and this signal transduction can actually tweak into the transcription regulation in different bacteria. So we, we had some time in order to understand the biology of biofilm like bug by bug because we, don't, we have different models. And by understanding this biology, we had some kind of hypothesis. So these are the biofilm quantification. We just first like screen our biofilm uh, by crystal violet assay as a preliminary uh, like screening methods for biofilm assay. And we found like our bugs, hey, it's doing like a very good job in forming biofilm. Um, then, as I mentioned, we need like some kind of like application of some nano technology somehow, which I'm, as I said, like I'm a purely microbiologist. So, you, you know, you don't ask me about machine learning, about nanotechnology. I'm just presenting like my collaboration uh, um, um, uh, with. So uh, if I want to understand, I, I know about, I can understand the biology of the biofilm. And I thought, okay, we can some kind of interfere with the signaling molecule, just like, you know, here, like if I want, I, I want you guys like not to communicate each other with your mobiles. I just cut the Wi-Fi, okay? How is day? Hot that day? Hot day? Bussara, bussara, bussara. So we invented uh, a nano uh, nano carriers, liposomes and uh, nano emulsions, and these are the liposomes are actually phospholipids. So it assumed it, it, it's safe because it's part of the, our cell membranes and uh, like plasma membranes, and we conjugated these nano particles with five different compounds: uh, cytokinin, curcumin. By Kaline, actually, I asked Naha yesterday for the pronunciation of the other two elements, which are like, you know, it's here, okay. But I know that the P is silent. So these are the natural compounds actually we are using as conjugated with the nanoparticles. And we first, we need to screen if these nanoparticles are safe as a plane, not conjugated. And we screen these nanoparticles with human lung fibroblast cells. And we ensure that using these nanoparticles is actually safe because if you are tar targeting a clinical trial, it's safe to be uh, conjugated with this. Uh, natural antibiotics uh, uh, or antimicrobials, let's say. Uh, these, are, uh, these are our outstanding results. It was actually like, you know, like this are an experiment literally of last uh, uh, Wednesday. I asked the, my student to, so the red columns are actually the biofilm. How about using the, the like, you know, these compounds actually using the, thy the thymokinone. This is one of the natural products that we found it had, does have an antibacterial effect. Cymokinin with nano emulsion, cymokinin with liposomes, and our control here is a vancomycin because we know that vancomycin is actually uh, antibacterial or antibactericidal effect against methicillin resistant staph aureus, and you can find a significant difference between the biofilm when we conjugated this with nano emulsions or the liposomes. Okay. Uh, finally, in like 30 seconds, uh, I, I want also to collaborate with like, I, I just thought like to bring this into a, some kind of like, you know, a machine learning and artificial intelligence. And by doing this, we are the genomics, part, we are the genomic guys. So we want to link some kind of, some kind of a sequence. It's called Kimers. And we would like to, you know, train our like, you know, machine in order to have an association between these Kimers 
and the biofilm. And by doing this, it will be really crucial in order to understand what are the genes during this biofilm formation that are up-regulated. Our hypothesis here that some genes are actually up or down-regulated during the biofilm. So by doing this schema analysis using a machine learning model, we can actually predict what are the genes that we target for uh, acute TR, TPCR. Okay. Uh, finally, these are uh, amazing collaborators. Uh, Nihal Asim is my PhD student, uh, Dr. Amina Serafin, Assistant <laughs> Professor uh, at Dual City, Dr. Maha Nas, Dr. Iman Badri is a professor of computational biology at Dual City, and our international collaborators, Ben, Sam, uh, Mark, and uh, Kathleen. Uh, these are funding uh, who actually paying us money. They are giving us some hard time, but thank you them anyway. Uh, these are my amazing team, and I think uh, I will have like 30 seconds to, you know, to thank my team because I'm always thinking like I'm the, this kind of like boring professor just like tweaking for give me results, give me results, and like you know they they have did they have did 90 per, 95 percent of the job. So I have to acknowledge all my postgraduate students and undergraduate students for this amazing work. Uh, these are my contact information. Uh, you can sc scan my business card uh, for any collaboration, and thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hadidi, for the interesting talk. Um, if anybody has any questions for our first two speakers, we can take two or three questions. Yes. Let me answer that. Thank you so much for this interesting talk. You put a lot of interesting results in one session. So I have. Any questions that we will discuss that in the hall? Okay, sure. So, but just you have to treat me first, okay? Yeah, wasn't that interesting? Chicken without any bugs. We'll ask you two questions. Just the mask is very important for the combined factor. Biofilm resistance. The biofilm was done in another model, which is MERS. The genomics part, I presented the genomics part of the compiled factor, and this kind of applied part is applied to the insulin resistance network. It's another model. So, you did not try to study the, the impact of the uh, Compile factor plus plus and acid plus plus on the on the competitive inhibition of compile factor and the you know, unit. You know, uh, that's actually one of our interests now is also to try the probiotics. Uh, from maybe from the lab plus plus also we can try the probiotic increase and as I said, like we have to standardize the protocol of the biofilm inhibition and bacteria uh, side of the One this is standardized. Uh, our aim is to have like a bank of natural products, including probiotics and bacteria feeds. You know, because we know, like from our experience, that it might be like some kind of a synergistic effect yeah. in the nature, especially between the nanoparticles and the bacteriophage. And yes. I, I know that uh, there is an interesting topic today about the bacteriophage. It might be also something worth discussing. This synergistic effect. That curcumin has been overstudied. I know, I know. And I'm saying that we didn't have like a key active bacteria, so that's why we're using this curriculum. It's a good one, and also, the doctor has also a reticle of this other compound we are preparing now. So I just scream, you know, we are having like a bag. Another technical question I suffered in my life for the structure program that you are using the software for the segregation of the population. Yes, it's called the source attribution analysis. Um, based on a theory which has been, you know, first established for the thyroid. Yes. So, but we are using here a bacteria as a haploid. Yeah. So, how did you handle or how you assure uh, that okay. the segregation of this model is good? This is a really good question. Most uh, similar scenario. This is a perfect question. Like, uh, as I said, like, uh, why we do this structure, we do some kind of a self attribution test. Like, uh, so, a self attribution is you have like some bugs with no source. Yeah. And you self attribute it to see the accuracy of your, of your model. Once you set this self attribution task, you can then use it as a source attribution. So we can, let's say, like we have some kind of validation of the, of the model before implementing it in our. You can just compare it with the distance analysis you have built in. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. But my, my, my question also is that for the next to Tunisia and Soka. Yes. 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 Just a very fast question about the did you try did you try the scholarship program? I mean your, your data is not representing Tunisia, it's obvious. But you have adequate data to establish a scholarship program based on the resistant strains that you already established in your research, which is really very interesting and it's a hard work. 
it's obvious that you have interesting results that you might also implement in a stewardship program in the hospitals. This is num number one. And number two, for the E. coli that I've seen, in the emerging resistant, uh, I will just give you the, 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 the experience in Palestine for the union tract infection, for the opportunistic infection of E. coli. Now we're using the amicacin as a first drug of choice. Based on this, you know, it, it's enough. I see just some interesting results, uh, and we can discuss that. I just want to give the mic to another, uh, another question. Like, like you have uh, said, yes, we have just uh, eight uh, university centers, and it is, uh, is uh, not enough for uh, uh, national surveillance. And uh, among our um, future plans, we will uh, take uh, other centers uh, to participate with. Uh, uh, in this, uh, in our uh, national network, and we try to implement uh, the to uh, community uh, uh, centers, uh, community laboratories uh, to uh, for the students. Concerning amicacin, amicacin isn't the first choice uh, of uh, amicacin uh, uh, use, but in multidrug resistant. When we are in a uh, health assisted infection, yes, it's, uh, it is uh, the, the first. Because uh, we have uh, more than 50% uh, uh, of resistance to uh, genitalism. And, uh, yeah, it's 80%. Yes, 80% for you? Yeah, Other question? Uh, I have a question. Uh, I have a question to Amun. Uh, my question is about very uh, information and unpredictable symptoms. I want to make uh, sure that I got that point correct. Uh, you were talking about uh, antimicrobial agents and very information. That's drug, correct? Yes. Okay. yes. Uh, uh, we, we name, like, you know, like, this is a clear, like some kind of misconfusion, a confusion between what is antimicrobial and let's say our classification of the antimicrobial agent, which is not synthetic. We name the antibiotics, which are synthetic uh, antibiotics. So these are potential anti antimicrobial agents, which are natural. And we propose that it does have an antibacterial effect. Can we say like antibiotics, we use the drug to treat patients? And antimicrobial is to just disinfect or to uh, sanitize services. Well, actually, that's really uh, very nice because we thought about, you know what, uh, 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 you know what, uh, Dr. Tariq, we actually thought about what's next, you know, about a prototype. And we thought about if we, we have this kind of a potential antimicrobial effect, would, would, it, would we market it? as a potential antibiotic or a disinfectant. And you know what? We agree that we will mark it as a potential disinfectant because we know that the bathroom is actually for, for at uh, medical catheters uh, at, at any hospitals because we know that, like also about the biology of like the extracellular matrix of any human, like eukaryotic cell, which is fibronectin. And like this bathroom have some kind of receptors that bind with fibronectin. So anyway, we thought actually like we use this as a disinfectant because we will actually skip a part of like very enormous clinical trials, which will take like years. And I don't think we have like that, we are old enough Thank not you. to wait for this. Yes. Shukran. And complimentary. Uh, good morning. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Khaled Chili. I am the focus point of the uh, 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 So, uh, the, the, the so, uh, concerning the uh, development of program, yes, we had uh, programs that uh, in progress. Right? Yes, and uh, the development in can be nationalized in the program, nationalized in the nationalized I'm coming to I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. 
And thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, I'm guessing you are interested in uh, green nanoparticles. So uh, I am wondering if you have tested the uh, other plants extract of the petrol part. Uh, I'm wondering if you have tested uh, other plant extracts other than the curcumin or retention oils. Thank you. Um, if uh, any, there are any further questions, you can speak to the speakers during the coffee break. And uh, now it is my pleasure to uh, present Dr. Nada Dara from Beirut Arab University in Lebanon. Uh, Dr. Nada, please go on. Give me a second, please. Yeah, sure. Please. Uh, good morning, everybody. So first, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Nada Dara, Associate Professor of Food Safety and Technology at uh, Beirut Arab University. I'm currently as well a new AGIA member, and here I would like to express my, uh, actually, uh, uh, thanks to AGIA for accepting me among this beautiful AGIA family. And uh, so today, my talk will be entitled Antibiotic Resistance as a Global Threat from Community to Food Safety Perspectives. So first of all, what are antibiotics? So antibiotics uh, are medicines that we use to kill bacteria. However, as you can see, some of, the, some of the bacteria, they try to develop resistance, and consequently, we end up by having antibacterial resistance. So according to the World Health Organization, antibiotic resistance is one of the biggest threats that is uh, actually, uh, uh, we are being exposed everywhere and developed as well as in developing countries. And uh, as uh, Dr. Asma mentioned previously, so if no urgent action is to be taken right now, around 10 million deaths will be occurring by 2050. So here I would like actually to talk about the combination of intrinsic and extrinsic factor that is leading to the antibacterial resistance. So among the intrinsic factors, we have the target modification, the enzymatic degradation, increased increased influx. But here I would like to more emphasize on the extrinsic factors that are starting by misusing antibiotics, abusing the antibiotics, and also overusing antibiotics. So let's go a deep further and check this complex web where everything is connected in terms of uh, bacteria resistance. So at the level of uh, humans, animals, and as well plants, we have antimicrobial misuse and overuse due to the lack of awareness and knowledge. And this is actually is ending up by having bacteria resistant bacteria and uh, uh, food and feed that actually is transmitting this resistant bacteria 
in food processing. And later on in this talk, I'm going to talk as well about antibiotic residues in the food, which is another actually uh, life-threatening problem. So also, as you can see from this slide, we have have uh, uh, resistant bacteria coming from water discharge, from medical uh, facil facilities, from aesthetical manufacturing and farms, and also due to the lack of access to clean water sanitation and hygiene, we end up by more and more transmitting resistant bacteria to uh, uh, actually to human, which can uh, lead as a consequence to increase the risk of morbidity and fatality, uh, to actually increase is the risk of international trade the problem as well as increase the health expenditure services. So as per the Lancet publication in 2019, as you can see from the slide, 1.27 million deaths are coming from a direct result of antibiotic resistant infection. And here I would like actually to show you how the CDC and the US, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, they are proposing a list of core action to prepare for the resistance. So starting by preventing the infection and controlling it, passing to tracking and data. So we need to get more data. And this is actually what we are doing as researchers to get more data, in, uh, uh, such as Dr. Muhammad has uh, shown also his data on uh, resistant bacteria. Also, uh, we should work more on antibiotic use. And I think the assess of usage and knowledge and attitude is one of actually the outcome of this campaign. Uh, and also improving the level of environment and sanitation would be one of the action to work on, last but not least, working on developing more vaccines at the level of uh, therapeutic and diagnostics. So now I will tackle the issue from a food safety perspective, since I'm a food safety expert. So how antibiotic resistance is actually being transmitted from farm to table. So this is actually also uh, published by CDC. As you can see, it also starts with the resistance. So the animal, they carry uh, uh, in the bacteria in their intestine. So uh, among these bacteria, some of them, they don't uh, actually respond properly to the antibiotics and end up by having resistant bacteria. This resistant bacteria will be spread uh, through uh, animal products or even through produce or uh, prepared food through cross-contamination, as well as it will be spread in the environment through animal poop. Uh, we will be exposed to it through directly contaminated food, so consuming contaminated food, or through the exposure to the environment, and we end up by having the impact on us through developing either mild illness or severe illness. And here, as we can see, about one in five resistant infections are being caused by germs from food and animals. So resistant bacteria will end up by actually triggering food poisoning. So anybody actually can get food poisoning. But here I would like to emphasize on the high risk population, especially adults age 65 and older, uh, children uh, uh, younger than age five, pregnant women and people with weak immune system. How do we prevent the occurrence of uh, food poisoning and reduce it as much as possible? By controlling actually uh, the usage of antibiotic, uh, antibiotics in the farm and going through the, uh, all the stages of the food chain and by enforcing more rules and regulation in terms of antibiotic usage. And here I would like to talk about the four steps, uh, the key steps in food safety, according to the WHO. So to avoid any kind of uh, bacterial contamination, we need to clean properly, to clean our hands, to clean all the food contact surfaces, to separate, separate raw from cooked to avoid cross-contamination, to cook at a high temperature in the core of the product to destroy bacteria, and last but not least, to chill uh, the food in order to uh, control the growth of, of bacteria and inhibit as much as possible. So now I'm going to uh, show you some of my uh, research work tackling basically uh, two actions uh, proposed by the CDC. The first one is going to be about the antibiotic use and access, where we published a work assessing knowledge, attitude, and practice towards antibiotic use among Lebanese health profession students. And the other one is more uh, tracking and data. So here I'm going to show you two of my uh, publications uh, uh, working on antibiotic residues screening in breast milk among Syrian refugee lactating mothers, and also we assessed antibiotic residues in chicken meat samples in Lebanon. So I will start with the first study, and here, so uh, the main objective of the study was to provide a snapshot of the current knowledge and attitude of health profession students towards antibiotic use in two universities in Lebanon. So we randomly showed in students, so we approached 320 students, but only 226 approved to take part uh, uh, in this study. 
So the study got the ethical approval of the Institutional Review Board of the University, and we administered a questionnaire consisting of four parts, but I'm going to tackle only the three for, uh, first parts, assessing social demographic characteristics, assessing knowledge and behavior regarding antibiotic use, and assessing as well the utilization practice of antibiotics among students. So the study was conducted between March and May 2019, and definitely the data was uh, analyzed uh, through SPSS. So here, as you can see, uh, the outcome of the social demographic characteristic, the majority of the participants, they were 82%, they were female, so they were single, 94%, and they were residing in Beirut. And here, as you can see, only 14% were belonging to the graduate study, and the other student, they were undergraduate student. So uh, now I'm going to show you some data about the knowledge of the student responding to the survey. So I can tell you that so far the students, they were really knowledgeable about antibiotic use. This actually was a good point. However, I believe that since they belong to medical faculty, so they do have like a proper background. So we need to do this study among like multidisciplinary faculties to check again the uh, antibiotic usage. So as you can see, 75% of the students, they were aware that we use antibiotics when we have a bacterial infection. 44 when we have bacterial infection with fever, and 82% they were aware that uh, antibiotic resistance is due to the use of antibiotics when it's not necessary, or when not completing the full course of antibiotic, or when using it without physical, uh, sorry, physician prescription, so self-medication. So we went a step further and we tried actually to score the questionnaire. We used a scoring. Uh, so we have the score one when the, the students say are answering one of, out of three uh, 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 response correct. So score two, it's when they are answering 37.5 to 75% of the question correct. And score three, when they are answering more than 75% of the questionnaire correct. And here actually we noticed a, a significant difference uh, among the ages. So when the students were uh, between 20 and 30 years, they were answering way better when they were uh, less than 20 years. And among the educational level also, we noticed that for the first year students, only 14% they were answering the uh, questionnaire correctly. However, for the fifth year, 64% they were answering correctly, which is a normal actually improvement in the uh, study plan uh, of the uh, uh, curriculum. And they will get more and more knowledge about antibiotics. So now passing to antibiotic use and misuse, among the students, 67% they used antibiotics within 12 months prior to the study. Okay, so this is a high percentage actually. With 10%, they got more than three times antibiotics. And uh, uh, so as per the study of Mohadine al, a healthy individual should not consume antibiotics more than one time per year. So I believe this is a high percentage. So concerning the practice, so how do they uh, actually take antibiotics based on what? So uh, definitely 30, they did not receive antibiotics, but 44 only, they take antibiotics when they consult a physician, and 13%, they take antibiotics without consultation directly from the pharmacy. So I don't know actually about uh, the regulation of pharmacies in all the Arab countries, but in Lebanon, you can actually purchase antibiotics from the pharmacy without a prescription. So here we should emphasize on the role of the pharmacist actually in uh, uh, giving antibiotics to uh, uh, patients. And 20%, they take antibiotics from the pharmacy by prescription without consultation. So here, for example, now, you know, with the social media, you can't contact the doctor through the phone call. So without physical consultation, he will prescribe you an antibiotic and you go to the pharmacy and you get it. So we have a faulty antibiotic use due to the over-prescription or without prescription. So clinicians should risk the term when the therapy is warranted for a given patient. So concerning the, uh, the reason of taking antibiotics, so there are 31, they said, we don't know. We take antibiotics without, without reason. When we suffer from like uh, slight symptoms, we start by taking antibiotics. But here it is to be noted that 28% they take when they are facing from a, a, a pain throat and 13 bronchitis. So as a conclusion for the first study, we can say that so far the students were shown to be knowledgeable about antibiotic resistance. And they all agreed that this resistance was due basically to the fact of using antibiotics without physician prescription or when it's not necessary or when not completing the full course of antibiotics as agreed with the other studies working on antibiotics use and assessment. So now I will pass to the tracking and data and I will actually show you briefly some of the results of screening antibiotic residues in breast milk and in chicken meat samples in Lebanon, respectively. So I will start with the study of a breast milk. So 
maybe you will wonder why did I thought about breast milk so it's a bit actually hard to work on it but we all know that uh, occupational exposure and environmental contaminants they are exposing lactating mothers to chemical contaminants and these chemical contaminants they are passing to the fetus through breastfeeding so uh, although we all know that breastfeeding is very healthy very nutritious however these contaminants they can pass to the baby and lead to several problems so here the uh, sample collection was taken uh, from a syrian refugee camp in the north region in lebanon in akkar uh, so we actually approached 50 lactating mothers out of which only 40 accepted to take part of the study so it was not actually easy to convince them to take part of the study you know that for the mother the breast milk is very precious actually so what we did is that we recruited the 40 mothers and we ask them to provide us with a breast milk sample three times. Why three times over three weeks? Because we all know that breast milk is highly affected by our diet. So in order to check if we have antibiotic residue from the food consumption, we took on three weeks, three samples from each mother, okay? So in total, for 40 mothers, we end up by having 120 breast milk samples that we collected by definitely electrical pump every time we were taking around 25 to 40 milliliters and then transported to the lab under chilling conditions for uh, LCMS, for liquid chromatography mass spectrometry analysis to check antibiotic residues. And also we administered in parallel a questionnaire for the mothers to check their dietary habits. So why do they consume to try kind of to do like a linking between what they are eating and what do they have in their breast milk as antibiotic residues so this is the procedure i will not go into the detail for the researcher interested to know more about this work we can like have a side talk later on so these are the antibiotics that we have screened so the questionnaire was validated because we were obliged actually to administer it in arabic and here i can tell you that while checking their food intake so so far only one mother take on a daily basis, they drink milk. 39 mothers out of 40, they don't drink, drink milk, okay? For the dairy products, the majority, they don't eat dairy products. So basically they rely on canning, on vegetables, on fruits. And as you can see from the questionnaire, they don't eat meat and poultry at all. I mean, never. So the 40 mothers, they never actually consumed during their lactating cycle or even during their pregnancy meat and poultry because it's a Syrian refugee camp so the I mean they are very uh, poor so they did not consume this and on top of that they did not take any antibiotic courses during pregnancy and lactating so it was very normal for us to end up by what by finding no antibiotic residues in their breast milk except oxytetracycline and the oxytetracycline was found in the breast milk of three mothers one of them presented the highest contamination because she was consuming the one that I told you about. She was consuming milk on a daily basis. So she was the one presenting the highest antibiotic residue level. And the two others, they were, uh, they were uh, consuming dairy products twice per week. So also they were shown to uh, present highest contamination level. And here, if I want to compare my study with other studies, so other studies working on breast milk, they ended up by having a high load of antibiotic residues in breast milk. But I, as I told you previously, since we are, were working on a refugee camp, so the dietary pattern were a bit different on the other of the other studies. So now let's pass quickly to the other uh, study assessing antibiotic residues in chicken meat samples. So here we took 80 chicken uh, meat samples from 19 farms in Lebanon, also LCMSMS. And here we tried to screen 30 antibiotic residues belonging to four families, sulfonamide, quinolone, tetracycline, and beta-lactam antibiotics. So definitely we assess the performance of the method with a high mean recovery. Here when I say high mean recovery, we take a blank sample, we spike it with antibiotics and we make sure that our method is valid. And here have a quick look, quick look with me on this result. Out of the 80 samples, only 18 were not contaminated with antibiotic residues and 78% of the samples, they were containing antibiotic residues with 54 poly contaminated, more than one residue, poly contaminated. This is really, I mean, life-threatening if we are consuming high quantity of antibiotic residues in the food, and it's a cycle. So we are being exposed not only from antibiotics itself, also from the food. So I'm trying to show you the other perspective from a food safety perspective. So this is probably due to the misuse of antibiotics in food animal production. We all know that in some farms, they use antibiotics as growth promoters. 
and this has to be bad. And on top of that, they don't respect the withdrawal period. So when you give antibiotics to the animal, we need to wait a withdrawal period in order to reduce the quantity of antibiotics. Now let's pass to the different families. So for sulfonamide, the percentage of positive samples it was low, between 1.25 to 3.75. For quinolone, the percentage was 32.5% of the samples were contaminated with ciprofloxacin. But here I need to highlight that the mean level was below the MRL. When I say MRL, it's the maximum residual limit according to the EU. So the limit was below, so the limit is not high. However, for uh, sarafloxacin, as you can see at the end, so 19 was the mean and the MRL is 10. So it was like double more than the maximum residual permissible limit published by EU. For tetracycline, 17.5% of the samples, they were contaminated with tetracycline and 225 they were contaminated with amoxicillin. And here I would like to say that the three actually antibiotic residues found the most uh, actually ciprofloxacin, uh, tetracycline, and amoxicillin. Uh, we did other work uh, towards antibiotic resistance, and we figured out that Salmonella and E. coli, in some of the studies, they were highly resistant to these uh, antibiotics. And these antibiotics were found to be the mostly uh, used one in Lebanese farms, okay? So we have a problem of co-occurrence of multi-drug residues in 53%, basically to the misuse of antibiotics and not respecting the withdrawal period. So as conclusion on future direction, so how to prevent the resistance by improving the health system performance, by actually, uh, uh, actually working on providing a safe food and a safe water, by uh, assigning more responsibilities to the ministries to check basically the Ministry of Agriculture to check the usage and the forms of antibiotics by improving vaccination, working on it and communicating health issues and by um, uh, improving the hygienic level in terms of food safety. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks a lot, Nada, for the great presentation. There's a moment for two questions. Uh, we would do it after. Oh, okay. After, yeah. okay. Uh, so um, I think we are 20 minutes behind the schedule. For, yeah. Uh, so it's it's really interesting to see how you cover the whole cycle of you know the data collection, the antibiotic use, and uh, and access, etc. Uh, we would have the questions right afterwards, like after the second talk. Yeah, so yeah, let's pull sure. together the discussion. So it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Raida Snene. She's from the University of Benghazi, Libya, and she will be talking about the correlation between antibiotic resistance and the COVID-19 treatment. So um, let's welcome her to the stage. Yeah, please. Thank you. Yes. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, IDEA for the hospitality and uh, inviting me uh, to uh, to, uh, to this presentation of the nightmare of the antibiotic resistance during and beyond COVID-19. Uh, actually, myself calling the antibiotic resistance a silent killer and a very serious problem and uh, thank you for the clever the clever choice of the uh, the topic uh, and this presentation will cover the COVID-19 pandemic uh, the risk of antibacterial resistance during and after uh, the Libyan experience is not a very a much good experience, but I have to uh, show it a uh, recommendation. So uh, first of all, uh, what's the SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19? As you know, it's a severe coronavirus disease identified in 2019. In Wuhan, China, it's caused by novel strain, the beta uh, coronavirus enveloped uh, positive strand RNA virus uh, known as SARS-CoV-2. It's highly transmittable and pathogenic viral infection, mainly transported through, uh, transmitted through the contact with the respiratory droplets. It's not an airborne. It's not the first in the, uh, the past decades have uh, seen endemics, outbreaks, like uh, one in the Middle East, 
uh, respiratory syndrome, coronavirus in uh, 2012, and severe acute respiratory syndrome related coronavirus in uh, 2002. But this one was the most dangerous with the high, highest fatality rate ever. So, on February 11, uh, 2020, WHO officially announced the outbreaks as a pandemic and the global health crisis threatening the public has been started. Okay, here is a quick review on the signs of symptoms. Uh, COVID-19, we have all agreed that it's a viral infection, but the clinical manifestation may present similarly to the bacterial pneumonia. It can be classified according to the severity of the symptoms and to the mild. Uh, it's a majority of the patient with 81% with mild uh, symptoms like the upper respiratory tract, viral infection, dry cough, mild fever, sore throat, uh, headache. Uh, and I'm sure uh, most of you or all of you experience have these uh, uh, symptoms. Uh, the moderate uh, symptoms from the respiratory symptoms of cough, shortness of breath, tachypnea, uh, severe, uh, severe pneumonia and uh, acute respiratory disease syndrome, sepsis or septic shock in 14% of the patients. The critical and uh, the final stage is uh, acute respiratory disease syndrome and the, uh, the cytokine storm of multi-organ dysfunctions in 5% is very serious and dangerous. Uh, the cardiac injury, cardiomyopathy, viral myocarditis, uh, the case of fatality rate of the critical patient is over uh, 40%. Percent. So, uh, management and treatment strategies. Okay, and in, in management, the uh, uh, treatment strategies have been uh, approaches have been unique over the past few years. Uh, that the medical uh, professionals have spent a lot of time improvising and uh, 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 learning how to treat this uh, um, novel virus without any previous experience. Uh, taking into consideration that a new data updating uh, uh, nearly every hour regarding the clinical characteristic, diagnosis, uh, treatment options and outcomes of COVID-19. Uh, the trusted sources of information uh, for the health provider, they were rely uh, mostly on the WHO and the CDC, uh, but for the publication, uh, uh, most of them rely on the, uh, the you know, the like uh, social media uh, and affected dramatically by the social media. Uh, general treatment, as you see here, uh, like uh, the bed rest and complete bed rest, an adequate uh, water and, and calorie um, to avoid the risk of dehydration, uh, uh, oxygen saturation and testing, uh, monitoring the, uh, the blood count, CRB, urine tests and other biochemical indices. Measurement is very important in this uh, uh, stage, uh, including liver and kidney uh, function, myocardial enzyme, coagulation factors and ever. Uh, symptomatic treatment using uh, acetaminophen orally and some uh, for kids that suffering from seizures, convulsions, and anticonvulsion. Oxygen therapy through the nasal catheter, oxygen mask in emergency, and this is uh, very critical, but it will cause us a serious problem later. Uh, in phase of uh, or in non-phase of ventilation, uh, provide to air, uh, uh, most of the patient antiviral drugs uh, like the uh, uh, useful one like uh, lobinavir, ritonavir, uh, ribavirin, arabidol, arthrobitically useful. Uh, there is much, uh, you know, in the beginning of the beginning uh, uh, pandemic, uh, you have heard about the chloroquine and the hydroxychloroquine, and the um, actually many surveys uh, have discovered that chloroquine is more effective controlling the uh, treatment inhibition, uh, control treatment inhibition, uh, the progression uh, of the pneumonia and um, uh, improving the, uh, the lung function or shortening of the disease course, but uh, actually it has many side effects, so uh, uh, it has been avoided. Uh, boosting immune system, focus on healthy diet and uh, healthy habits is very important. Natural products, also uh, 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 um, recipes contained, like uh, you know, in Libya, it's called the Qastal Hindi. I don't know of the Indonesian, they have the same name as um, Saturia Castus, uh, the garlic, hypericum, uh, uh, sativa, Nigeria sativa, habit al baraka, al habba soda. Also, uh, they have many, uh, you know, uh, claimed to prevent uh, uh, COVID and what was uh, uh, extensively used. So, 
the role of antibiotic actor in this scary COVID-19 scenario. Uh, the early pandemic, uh, little was known regarding the presentation and disease progression rate of microbial or bacterial co-infection. So clinical decision were often determined through the crisis mode approaches, rendering high initial rate of antibiotic use, additionally effective antiviral yet to be developed. Bacteria was a prognostic factor that worsened the outcome. Various antibiotic use ways uh, may not prevent or treat COVID-19 because it's viral, but it has been used frequently both as a kind of a placebo or soothe the uh, panicked nerve as a way to treat comorbid bacterial infection. To make the patient recovery even harder, uh, these infections like sepsis and uh, severe acute respiratory infection. Use uh, in uh, bacterial, these antibiotics was used in bacterial secondary infection like hospital uh, acquired uh, bacterial infection and ventilation acquired bacterial infection. A, cl a clinician to prescribe broad spectrum antibiotic or antimicrobial uh, more often than they otherwise because the processing of the microbi microbiological sample in the saturated emergency rooms and overloaded laboratory was difficulty. No, no evidence-based antiviral treatment of COVID-19 have been developed in setting of highly stressful situations. So we have these challenges of high rates of antibiotic prescribing despite low rates of respiratory cultures and confirmed biological infection. So the challenge was that septo, uh, septo, uh, um, symptomology of the disease with the majority of pre patients experience a dry and productive cough. Uh, there is a limited uh, personal protective equipment early in the pandemic, concern of a transmission and aerosolization, issues of laboratory collections, limited resources for sample specimen. So the initial doubt and difficulty to obtaining microbiological rest have been a determining factor in difficulty implementing the antimicrobial stewardship that Dr. Amr highlighted. Uh, approached during the approaches during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, the rate of antibiotic prescribing was ranged from 57 to 95 percent in hospitalized patients, despite the bacteria co-infection being reported in just one to eight percent of the patients. Another challenges uh, uh, factors contribute uh, are the lack of uh, information, uh, 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 insufficient follow-up time, a heterogeneous use of the immune modulatory uh, uh, drugs and the difference in the availability of infection control measures based on the number of cases bear centers that a lot of cases admitted. Uh, traditionally, the culture requires from two to three days uh, to get a result, uh, or maybe longer to some organism uh, that can detect and define bacteria infection. Uh, so, an uh, improvement in this uh, uh, method uh, is a key factor for improving the, the use of the antibiotic. The problem of heavy use of antibiotic is uh, that that it has a potential to create an even bigger problem of bigger problem of uh, antimicrobial resistance and countries with particularly high incidence of COVID-19 has shown that significant rate of infection caused by multidrug resistant bacteria. The finding is a major reason why the WHO recommendation to refer to the antimicrobial stewardship. Uh, this is a very important, it's a coherent stewardship, uh, it's a coherent uh, set of actions uh, which should promote the responsible use of antibiotics. Uh, this definition applied to the individual action, uh, action or uh, a, a local action and uh, uh, national level and global level and across the human and animal health. So the objective of stewardship improve awareness, understanding, uh, strengthen the knowledge and evidence space through, uh, through the surveillance and researches, reduce the incidence of uh, um, infection, optimize the use of antimicrobial, and develop. Uh, I think this is the most important uh, important uh, uh, objective we have to focus on our countries. Uh, develop an economics case sustainable investment that take in account the need of all countries and increase the investment in a new medicine, diagnostic tools, and vaccines. So, uh, a situation in Libya, um, uh, the uh, monthly, uh, you know, we have the National Center of Disease Control. The National Center has reported the first case in uh, 24th of March 2020. Currently, uh, public health resources and uh, information in Libya are inadequate, and the actual, actual number of infections is highly uncertain. 
the spread of infection and extent of COVID-19 epidemic in Libya is determined to some extent by social culture customs, tradition, adherence to phys uh, physical distance. Uh, as you see here, we have a high number of deaths. Uh, challenges in Libya. Uh, uh, you know, as a developing country, the problem is even worse uh, in where the lack of antimicrobial resistance surveys and control policies, unfortunately, are the norm, and non-compliance with uh, prevention control measures. In Libya, the misuse and overuse of antimicrobial agents by the public is widespread and can be purchased like in Lebanon. It can be purchased from pharmacies without any prescriptions, and this can uh, lead to the widespread of multidrug resistant organism. The state of health in Libya was not good, particularly in the last few years, and the reason the, uh, for that may be the political conflict, the lack of good administration and resources, and maintenance of hospital, uh, decreased number of well-trained healthcare workers, uh, absence of surveillance of uh, different diseases and support of my uh, medical researches. The poor state of health aggravated the problem of antimicrobial resistance in the country. And the healthcare uh, system, Libya uh, actually faced a serious challenge that COVID-19 could spread rapidly through the population, particularly among uh, those of the most vulnerable group, including the injured patient, internally displaced patients, uh, people, prisoners, and immigrants. Colonization is the most likely the reason of outbreak for outbreak in Libyan hospital, and failure in the cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization is a key factor in spreads. Uh, this is a good news, it's not all the bad news. In February 12, uh, 2019, there is a signed national plan of action to prevent and contain antibiotic resistance in Libya. It was signed uh, in a Tripoli and it was attended by a representative of uh, uh, United Nations Agency, national, international organization, experts from different sectors, dean of university and uh, munis uh, municipalities, uh, health uh, information centers and ministers. So uh, the key objective is to support joint uh, effort with WHO to uh, combat the spread of bacteria resistant antibiotics, enhance the meaningful involvement of the awareness and understanding of the antimicrobial resistance. So um, uh, the experience of the, uh, this is the Benghazi Medical Center, it's, it's, it's the city from uh, where I come. So uh, it's a Benghazi Medical Center, and this is the uh, uh, university hospital. Uh, it's uh, served as a, a public referral center with the largest bed capacity of uh, 1,200 uh, beds in the, the eastern uh, part of Libya. It has uh, five towers, and the fifth tower, Burj Al Amal, is completely dedicated to the COVID-19 patients. So what's the situation there? Uh, mostly in the world, most of non-hospitalized -hospital uh, COVID-19 should receive no antibiotics. But in Libya, uh, there was like, um, you know, uh, uh, prescription that is united for all patients. It contains like azithromycin, 500 milligram, once daily for five days, uh, um, zinc tablet, vitamin C, and Benadol. If you see it in your pharmacy, you know that it's a confirmed uh, COVID-19 patient. So uh, um, antibiotic, typically those used for community required acquired pneumonia, broad spectrum antibiotic were uh, prescribed uh, extensively. Um, we know that uh, azithromycin have good repetition inhibiting protein synthesis and functionally reduce the inflammation and viral replication, uh, so in inhibit the virus uh, production um, uh, and should help the, uh, clinically reduce the virus transmission. Uh, but uh, the data of 50 pa patients was admitted in the first six months to the center showed that the 90% of the patients receiving antibiotic uh, and 70% of them receiving multi-antibiotics and only one, uh, two percent uh, was confirmed with bacterial infection. They uh, was prescribed with no evidence. So. Uh, it's important to understand the trend of antibiotic prescribing and associated risk factor. The biphasic pattern uh, was also recognized in the BMC with two specific moments. The first moment corresponds to empirical coverage for all cases of COVID-19, pneumonia, and high admission rate to our hospital. So we see that augmenting amoxicillin clavinate used as azithromycin, both have no effect on the urgent or serious threat pathogens. The second moment uh, uh, responds to the phase in which admission to a critical care units for patients with more severe disease probably correspond with an increase in nosocomial infection. Uh, 
We observed significant increase in a broad spectrum antibiotic uh, uh, empiric treatment, prescribing uh, empiric treatment for the uh, community acquired bacterial infection, hospital acquired, and ventilator acquired. So the reported antibiotic use, here we have uh, this uh, long list. Uh, variable associated with receiving two or more empiric uh, courses include the ICU admission, length of stay in the ICU, mechanical uh, ventilation. All of them are risk factor for hospital acquired illness. And antibiotics were commonly prescribed uh, uh, for secondary nosocomial infections. Uh, like, uh, as I mentioned, uh, they are uh, prescribed according to the case evaluation and without any published national guideline. So uh, the, the, let's don't forget the problem of availability. So uh, the antibiotic use like cephalosporins, um, uh, we know that the urgent threat and serious threat of uh, pathogens uh, are becoming uh, resistant to second generations. Uh, quinolones, carbaminam, tigecyclines, and lisinid. Should be noted that the vancomycin, carbaminam, tigecyclines, cefetrexone, and lisinid are classified are as critically important antimicrobial for the human medicine by the WHO. So the antibiotic to treat patients with COVID contribute to save lives of millions now, but indicates to come the current upsurge on their use uh, uh, responsible for the large number of the uh, deaths. And persistent use of antibiotics has provo provoked the emergence of multi-drug uh, resistance organism and decline in effectiveness, uh, effectiveness of these compounds, which possess a threat of for survival rate uh, uh, from the serious infection, neonatal sepsis, and the hospital acquired infection. Thus, uh, limiting the potential health benefit of surgeries, a transplant, and even cancer treatments. Uh, another parallel group was working with us. They taking di like a swab, rectal and oral and uh, nasal swabs from different 43 patients and uh, trying to characterization the demographic and the clinical uh, data of isolation center characterization of the bad machines uh, that revealed that the most prevalent isolates were the Clacella pneumonia, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Actinobacter rumani, Citrobacter frandi, uh, Citrobacter yangi. Uh, some of the um, um, uh, uh, organisms are environmental, multidrug resistance, some are uh, insect pathogens, uh, methicillin resistance, Aphylococcus aureus, vancomycin resistance, and uh, others. Okay, the guideline uh, uh, recommendation, we have actually several organizational guidelines recommend starting antibiotic therapy if there is concern of bacterial pneumonia or sepsis, but to re-evaluate daily and de-escalate or discontinue if uh, no evidence of bacterial infection is observed. The World Health Organization has released guidance discourage the use of antibiotic therapy unless signs and symptoms of bacterial infection exist. Uh, the American Thoracic Society and the, the Infectious Disease Society of America also guideline do not recommend uh, routine as uh, uh, gram stain and culture with non-severe uh, cap or no, those without multidrug resistance organism. The risk factor due to overbore yield and detection of organisms. Uh, 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 all these organizations uh, recommend strongly uh, initiating antibiotic base uh, of clinical judgment rather than uh, uh, brocalcitonin alone. The revised uh, recommendation of um, um, empiric uh, treatment strategies and make additional recommendation. And uh, one important difference between the latest guideline and the one in 2007 is that they recommends more microscopic structure, uh, microscopic uh, sorry, studies of respiratory and uh, tract sample of some subgroup of patients to avoid unnecessarily prescribing therapies. Um, as uh, my colleague said, in uh, that it, um, it, it uh, uh, antimicrobial affects health and, and wealth dramatically, and, and the invention of antibiotic and really changed the modern medicine forever. Uh, sample infections uh, that were fatal uh, in the past, they were uh, suddenly treat treatable, uh, saving life and reducing hospital stays. Uh, while uh, this was uh, valuable, it, it bring uh, us with hidden and bigger risk of antibacterial resistance that the United uh, UN Interagency Coordination in 19, uh, 
2019, sorry, and that warranted that by 2050, the antibiotic resistance disease could cause 10 of million of deaths and damage by the economy. Because don't uh, forget that the uh, mostly effective are the mostly expensive antibiotic. So my general recommendation, uh, the problem of antibiotic resistance is very serious in Libya. The health authorities in particular in society, including education, higher education, scientific research, so should address this problem urgently. The crisis of antimicrobial has reached a stage that requires ministries of health establishing monitoring system routine testing for antimicrobial sensitivity and education of all the uh, healthcare workers, pharmacists, and community on the risk of, of this uh, antibiotic use, overuse. The surveillance uh, is very important of antibacterial use is needed and antimicrobial resistance. The information from both surveillance program will provide data for urgent and serious threat uh, pathogens in the country. Uh, also provide the data required to direct policy to the overuse of antimicrobial. Uh, reducing the impact of the hospital acquired a nosocomial infection in our hospital, our hospital is urgently required. Uh, uh, this is can throw, uh, done through the proper cleaning, disinfection, sterilization according to the international standard. Such action is most likely reduce antimicrobial use in the hospital setting and may lead to reduce reduction of the high rate of antimicrobial uh, resistance. National program. Dealing with control of nosocomial infection in the country should be strengthened and updated regularly. A major component of the uh, future policies for prevention and control of antimicrobial resistance in Libya should be the education of the health uh, worker, pharmacists, and all these students. We must be vigilant that, and cautious that the fight against the COVID-19 doesn't invite uh, another significant threat to the humankind. Uh, um, very, uh, specific recommendation during the COVID era, uh, vaccination is very important. A screening patient upon admission to the ICUs and should be treated according to the updated antimicrobial use policy. We should focus on infection uh, prevention, control, hand hygiene, uh, PPE, uh, path, uh, patient path, environmental cleaning, disinfection, sterilization according to the international standard, education, and long-term studies are needed to assess the impact of the Increase of antibiotic use during COVID pandemic on hospital flora, and in turn, how this might affect the uh, future uh, nosocomial infections, uh, uh, nosocomial infection, and antimicrobial resistant uh, uh, control. Thank you for your attention. I think you need coffee now. Yeah, no need for a question. <laughs> Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Waida. I would just uh, kindly ask Dr. Nada to, to come to the stage, to come back to the stage. So we would have a few minutes for discussion. Um, we would probably take like two or three questions maximum. So please, yeah, would you please just come back to the stage? Um, I, uh, in regards to the standards from chicken that you collected, how do you try to look at the, if there's a difference in the antibiotic residues in, uh, for example, if kidneys and liver and the other fish? Or you just took random. Standards? You mean the different parts of the chicken itself? Yes, yes. No, they were all the samples from the breast part, so they oh, were yeah, all the, the same. It was uniform to be able to compare. And um, how do you track that down to the, to the farm to see if uh, the withdrawal time, for example, have influenced this? Yeah. Or uh, it just, uh, again, random collection? Yeah. Because usually what we have is that the owners of the farmers do not actually follow the appropriate procedures in terms of withdrawal. Uh, yeah, withdrawal sure. time and uh, sure. stuff. So, so, so uh, your answer is actually very, um, your question is very important because we need to work on this. But what we did right now was only a screening. So we were trying to screen in general among like 19 farms in Lebanon. Uh, if we do have residues in the chicken meat samples or not, the next step would be to try to correlate the farming practices in terms of withdrawal, in terms of animal feed, 
to gather an antibiotic usage in parallel with the residue. But in this study, we did not actually did this part, but definitely as a perspective of future direction, we should complete it with the practices, the farming practices to assess the correlation, definitely. So let's, oh yeah. I mean, we, let's, let's I mean, have the follow-up questions properly later. I think we do have two more questions, one from uh, Dr. Tariq and Dr. Ahmed. Uh, then we would uh, end the discussion afterwards because we don't have much time. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. My question is uh, to Torana. Uh, right before uh, resistance uh, is, uh, I think, it's uh, one dimension issue. Part of it is one dimension is a little bit of uh, use or overuse. It's probably the last one uh, actually, I think it's quite a number of studies about uh, activated uh, system or resistance of food and activated resistance of uh, some of the Latin microorganisms that I isolated from food uh, products like chicken or chicken. And I found that uh, these uh, isolates uh, showed uh, resistance quite a to antibiotics. Uh, that is usually represented by the uh, So, what do you think uh, should be done in order to uh, control uh, the amount of residues in meat or chicken or yeah. even the distance of uh, additions or isolated additions from the food? Uh, before you answer, I'll give me a hint. Uh, experience uh, some of the Arabian countries from the experience. It's something I think uh, very effective. In Denmark, for example, uh, food authority uh, budgets or food inspectors, when they go to the farms, they treat uh, the infected uh, family as drugs and they chase uh, the amount that they have and why they have this amount, from where they get the farmers have this amount, and they do inspection. Uh, the farms and even the house of farmers to make sure that they didn't hide any uh, drugs there. So, do you think this is because I think sometimes yeah. the government are not serious about yeah. farm levels, yeah, yeah. they are not serious regarding the overuse or abuse of the effect. So, you recommend. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Tarek, for the question. First of all, concerning the isolates, we did the same actually. We isolated salmonella for chicken. And we have noticed that it was developing resistant towards ciprofloxacin and tetracycline and amoxicillin. So it was like the, the, the findings were similar to the ones you obtained. Concerning the second part of the question, so as I mentioned previously, in Lebanon, the farms are controlled by the Ministry of Agriculture. So basically, the Ministry of Agriculture should control, first of all, the import of the quantity of antibiotics that has to be used in the farms. Number two, they have to train more the farmers on good farming practices, such as when to use the antibiotic, what is the quantity to be used, what about the withdrawal period. So I believe that so far we have also a lack of awareness. So besides the fact of misusing uh, due to the actually uh, the interest of using it as a growth promoter, because definitely it is being done like this. But beside this, we do have some farmers that lack awareness and knowledge about the usage of antibiotics. So here, I think the emphasis should be also on training, educating them. So it has to be actually uh, uh, controlled at two different levels, the level of import antibiotics, le the level of usage in the farms as prescribed by the VAT, and the level of spreading more awareness and education among the farmers about good farming practices. Thank you. Thank you, Nanda. Thank you, Ray. That was impressive. Just one recommendation is to stop the overuse and the unnecessary use of antibiotics and to establish that legislation for the pharmacists in pharmacy on how to fairly prescribe antibiotics. It should not be given as an OTC to the, to the, to the population. It has to be enforced, actually. And, and it's not working. Second, is a technical question for uh, uh, Nada. For, for why, why did you investigate in these four antibiotics in the middle of the breastfeeding movement? I mean, they are safe. Why don't you go for the gentamicin and for the vancomycin, which are really you know, contraindicating breastfeeding? I mean, yeah. you, you invested a lot of nice. Efforts and I think it's not yeah. easy to get yeah. mother's milk. 
investigated. And also, <laughs> and your, cycle very hard, really, your cycle is really biased. You selected 39 vegetarian women. No, not vegetarian. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. But, yeah, yeah, that's so why I told you it has to be done. Yeah. Like, and and uh, uh, I mean, among another population, not the refugees, not in the camp. So the setup should be different. But here, I want to say that concerning the why why did we select these antibiotics? Because I got the data from the Ministry of Agriculture, and these are the ones the mostly used in animal husbandry in Lebanon. So. and their breast milk uh, through a screening the antibiotics commonly used in the animal husbandry and the farms in Lebanon. And as for the data, uh, this is what actually is being used. And, and you have uh, ivermectin? What is it? Yes, yes. And colistin also. They use colistin in the past a lot also. Now it's uh, being, I mean, banned. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. So let's thank the speakers again uh, for the great presentations. Uh, so there are two more announcements before uh, we go to the uh, coffee break. So the first one, uh, there is a group photo for all the participants. This would be in front of the building downstairs. Uh, the second announcement, now we would uh, come back here uh, uh, quarter past 11. Uh, so we would have like a short coffee break, like 15 minutes. We are already behind the schedule. Uh, so please, uh, be here like at a quarter past 11. Yeah, thanks a lot. S'il vous plaît, on a une photo de groupe. Donc on se rassemble au niveau devant le bâtiment de recherche. Oui, bienvenue tout le monde à la pause café et on reprend à 11h15. Merci. Je suis en train de 
هذه ما كيف تشوفوه هنا هذا هكا هذا ما Comment est-ce que c'est Ça, je l'ai. Oui, ça, je l'ai. Oui. D'accord. Oui, je l'ai. Juste, je l'ai. 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 Je أنا خايف من لا لا بس عليك بس أنت أنا خايف أنت بس أنت مش في رسالة لا ما في مو ريمريج لا أنا بس خلينا نقص ال ال كن صد ما تبدل هذي نحب الحاجة Je vais
ما ف... اه اللي خليه ليه ليه ما نحبش اه ما نحبش اه لكن فما حاجة صالية ولا حاجة اه نسيوش نسيو بيعطيك الصحة ما نسيوش ولا وين اوكي برا برا صبرني في صبرني جو انا هي اللي ذاهو يا ماما هذه هي البال فيا دراسة يا درس ما فهمتش اللي طرا فيها ذكر حدو ما صافي باش تجينا
Oui, elle te fout. Mais comme t'as poussé.
Oui, une présentation texte. Oui. Après, c'est ça. Usage des antibiotiques. Ah, ben. Hey, il m'a amené la blonde. Ok. And the questions? Ok. Il m'a amené la blonde. The floor is yours. Good morning, everybody, and welcome back. Um, I know now that you are really awake because you got a good shot of coffee and caffeine, so I think your brains are pretty um, awake. At first, um, I'm Ahmad Amro, I'm an AGA member from Palestine at Kutch University since um, 2019. At first, I would like to thank Pastor Institute in Tunisia. Special thanks uh, to Ulfa Masoud and uh, everybody who is organizing here this event, and also to Hashmi Luzir, who I know from, from more than 10 years ago, we met here in, in Pastor Institute in 2012. Um, so I would like to thank you all for hosting us in this nice event, and I wish to get a nice discussion and a nice talks from the speakers and uh, we got with a nice take home message about the antibiotic resistance in in um, from uh, from Tunisia. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Riyad Mansour. 
Uh, Dr. Riyad will present his work in English, but he will speak in, in French. So those who cannot understand French like me can sleep well. So, <laughs> but of course, you know, we can, we can follow up with you actually. So um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Marhaba Bikum, c'est un honneur pour moi pour euh, présenter un petit travail. C'est après tout, ce sont des données plus ou moins que je n'ai pas trouvé vraiment qu'avec. Voilà. Donc, je vais parler de l'utilisation des antibiotiques dans le monde animal. C'est-à-dire, à travers notre profession comme médecin vétérinaire, je vais vous présenter quelque chose. Pourquoi l'usage des antibiotiques aujourd'hui est un problème sur le plan public que sur le plan animal et encore plus sur le plan environnemental. Donc, comme, int comme introduction, l'utilisation l'utilisation des antibiotiques dans le monde animal, c'est comme dans le monde euh, humain, mais malheureusement aujourd'hui, on va voir que l'utilisation est encore plus accentuée dans le monde humain que dans le monde animal. Donc, euh, l'émergence des bactéries résistantes aux antibiotiques est due généralement voilà, est due à l'utilisation depuis une soixantaine d'années, mais soixantaine d'années avec l'utilisation de la pénicilline la première fois et aujourd'hui on, on arrive à une utilisation massive des antibiotiques surtout chez le porc heureusement qu'on n'utilise pas aujourd'hui chez les bovins en Tunisie c'est pas l'aviculture comment dirais-je mais surtout chez les bovins oh là là donc c'est un phénomène vraiment complexe c'est multifactoriel, ça dépend de l'hôte, homme, plante ou autre. Ça dépend aussi de la bactérie, de son euh, génome, de la population bactérienne et bien sûr c'est l'environnement immédiat ou immédiat. Prenons un exemple sur une bactérie qu que j'aime, c'est chercher à colis. Cherchez à colis a montré que sur 20 veaux avec un antibiotique dans le lait et des veaux, une autre, une vingtaine autres, et on voit que sur le plan résistance, combien c'est une différence trop significative pour ne pas dire que vraiment c'est une signification. Puisque euh, à G56, on voit que 18 fois, plus euh, 4 fois ou 5, plus récent que pour le, pour le loup sans antibiotiques. Est-ce qu'il y a une possibilité de transmission Oui. La transmission peut être animal-homme, homme-animal ou à partir de l'environnement. Et on a vu que, on a montré que les, les Staphoreus multirésistants a été transféré ou transmis par l'être humain. Donc, est-ce qu'on peut faire une analyse de risque Oui, on a commencé à le faire. Mais est-ce que vraiment on peut arriver à voir qui est l'origine de cette résistance alors là, beaucoup de choses. Donc, on a des antibiotiques critiques. Et je pense que nos confrères, les médecins, vont parler de ça, hein, des troisième et quatrième générations de céphalosporines, les fluorécolines. Mais l'Organisation mondiale de la santé animale, ou l'OAI, a plus d'antibiotiques critiques. Donc, la liste pour l'OIE, c'est plus longue que pour l'OMS.
Qu'est-ce qu'on a utilisé comme antibiotique et pourquoi On l'a utilisé comme un précurseur de croissance. On l'a utilisé beaucoup. Jusqu'à l'an 2001 en Tunisie, où on a commencé à faire interdire, à interdire, interdire tout ce qui est utilisation dans l'aliment. Avant, on appelle ça un aliment médicamenteux. Malheureusement, euh, bah, ça, ça a duré une trentaine d'années, mais aujourd'hui, ils sont interdits. Pourquoi on choisit et comment on choisit Si le choix et les critères de choix de l'antibiotique en médecine vétérinaire, c'est la même chose qu'en médecine, c'est sur un diagnostic épidémie clinique, on l'appelle, ou bien qui a une autorisation de mise sur le marché et le délai d'attente. Bien sûr, le coût, c'est en premier lieu. Le médecin vétérinaire voit que l'utilisation d'antibiotiques doit être rentable pour lui sur le plan exercice et en même temps pour l'éleveur. Quelle est la prévention Sachant que de, de point de vue économique, et euh, des considérations économiques, on, sur le plan terrain, on fait le choix sur un, antibio, un, un antibiotique pas cher et en même temps à large spectre. Et pour cette raison, a, on utilise des antibiotiques comme on le fait à des doses un tout petit peu moins que la dose prescrite et sur le plan pharmacologique pour le traitement doit être accepté par l'éleveur parce que lorsqu'on donne un choix pour l'éleveur il va faire le bénéfice risque ou le coût bénéfice une analyse et, et voit combien il va payer pour avoir ce, en, cet antibiotique. Quelles sont les conséquences Quelles sont les conséquences de la résistance Bien sûr, la résistance aux antibiotiques, presque c'est la même chose que chez l'humain, c'est cette résistance entraîne un tout petit peu l'efficacité de cet antibiotique. Bien sûr, il y a la transmission directe, transmission ou le risque de transmission. Le risque de transmission pour l'éleveur avant tout. Bien sûr, il y a tout ce qui est média et communication et l'image de l'animal avec des antibiotiques. Donc, pour le faire, il faut voir un tout petit peu le vétérinaire, un diagnostic, une prescription. Mais ce sont en même temps la clé de voûte de la réussite du traitement d'une part et de ne pas transmettre à cet animal une bactérie plus résistante que la, que la première. On a la surveillance de l'utilisation des antibiotiques si on a des multiples modalités, mais malheureusement, malheureusement, on n'arrive jamais à prescrire un antibiotique sans savoir c'est quoi, de quoi s'agit-il, quelles bactéries qu'on euh, qu vise, et etc. Dans le monde animal, il y a des initiatives internationales. Je parle de l'OIE, la FAO et l'OMS. Il y a une activité récente sur le plan européen et ça doit être c'est l'approche One Health donc il faut prescrire avec une prescription un raisonnement donc je passe quelles sont les données j'ai cherché les données de l'utilisation des antibiotiques en Tunisie. 
j'ai trouvé en matière de dinar tunisien. Mais en France, on sait très bien que 728 tonnes d'antibiotiques utilisées chez l'homme, alors que le 2 tiers, 471 tonnes, sont utilisées pour l'animal. On sait très bien que 95% d'utilisation des antibiotiques pour les animaux à destination consommation humaine, où on appelle ça des animaux de rente, contre 5% pour les animaux de compagnie. En Tunisie, on voit que 10 fois, jusqu'à 15 fois annuellement, prescription de plus. On sait très bien que l'infectiologie, c'est le, c'est le, le troisième rang par rapport à d'autres maladies cardiovasculaires et, je ne sais pas, peut-être urinaires, si j'ai. Donc, on a 29,4% de progression, de taux de progression annuellement. Et on sait très bien, c'est tout ce qui est administratif, que la direction de la pharmacie et médicaments, les, la, la réglementation du secteur pharmaceutique en Tunisie, c'est trois euh, ou quatre administrations centrales et deux ou trois laboratoires qui sont en train de travailler sur ça. Donc, selon Mme Houdet Ben Khdija ou Dr Houdet, 200 millions de dinars tunisiens sont utilisés pour l'être humain, c'est 20 fois plus que l'utilisation chez l'animal. 90% en Tunisie, 90% de la résistance aux antibiotiques sont montrés et démontrés chez l'animal par rapport à 10% pour l'animal. Selon le professeur Melek Zrelli, il dit on ne sait pas la quantité d'antibiotiques utilisés dans le monde animal. Parce qu'il y a la contrebande, il y a les laboratoires, bon, les laboratoires, ce sont les fabricants de médicaments, entre parenthèses, qui vont directement à l'éleveur. Donc, un problème majeur pour la Tunisie, on ne sait pas, on sait que 10%, mais on ne sait pas la quantité exacte de la quantité d'antibiotiques distribués dans le monde animal. C'est la même chose qu'en médecine, les prescripteurs des antibiotiques ne sont pas que le médecin et les vétérinaires. Il y a des tas de choses, même l'éleveur, même l'ami, un camarade, je ne sais pas, de la famille qui vous conseille d'utiliser cet antibiotique par rapport à d'autres. Quelles sont les nouvelles Bonnes ou mauvaises, on ne sait pas. Donc, euh, on a un plan d'action tunisien avec l'Organisation mondiale de la santé, l'Organisation mondiale de la santé animale, la FAO, ont cinq objectifs dans ce plan 2019-2023. J'ai cité que quatre objectifs. Le cinquième, c'est socio-économique, c'est général. Understand the phenomenon. <rire> c'est savoir ce phénomène, mais le phénomène est là. Ce n'est pas un objectif aujourd'hui, on est là. On a des gènes de, de résistance, on a des éléphants fondamentaux. Donc le deuxième, c'est surveillance, renforcer la surveillance, réduire l'incidence de l'infection et baisser l'utilisation euh, des antibiotiques au monde animal et humain. Pour moi, lorsque je parle d'antibiotiques, c'est une responsabilité conjointe. Mais ce que je veux dire à travers ma profession comme vétérinaire, pour, the breed, pour les éleveurs, c'est la prévention et pas la prévention. Limiter les maladies, c'est à travers la prophylaxie et la prévention. Si on peut utiliser cet antibiotique, il faut l'utiliser correctement, respecter la dose, le délai d'attente et respecter le délai de traitement. N'oubliez pas, ce n'est pas coronavirus. <rire> en même temps, c'est 
importance de hand washing. Euh, laver les mains, c'est mieux pour une prophylaxie et prévention contre toute maladie transmissible, soit corona ou autre. Et merci pour votre attention. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wright. Uh, we'll open the floor for the questions after our next speaker, uh, Professor uh, or Dr. Posey Razim. He's from uh, Palestine, Polo, uh, Politic Sorry. University from Palestine. Correct? Correct. Yes. Uh, Dr. Fozzi will Just talk about faith therapy as a to antibiotics. Do you think that yeah. is possible? Okay. Yeah. Dr. Fozzi yeah. will answer. What? The question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you think that phage will be a good alternative for... It's one of them. It's... I don't think we still have any answer that is definite that will Probably end the, the problem. Probably in the talk you will... Yeah, more. in the talk. Yeah, yeah. sure. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, before, before Dr. Fozzi starts, I think... I think Ulfa has a good news for uh, the research group. Yeah. Could you please announce it? <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Tara. He just showed me the email. We have taken the ethical approval for questionnaires. So, inshallah, next week we will uh, launch the testing phase, and uh, next month we will start uh, the questionnaire and distributing it at a larger scale. Inshallah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, I would like to start uh, with thanking everyone here, uh, Dr. Ulfa, uh, Ziad, I don't know whether he's here or not, and the rest of the organizers. Actually, this is my second time in uh, Pastor Institute. I've been here some four years ago. 2019. 19. Yeah, okay, yeah, three years ago. And it's, it's nice, it's uh, actually, Tunisia is my second home, uh, just like any other Arab country. So thank you very much. Okay, so um, I, I would like to talk now, well, uh, first I thank all my colleagues who gave speeches before me, they introduced a problem. And I think I don't need to quote any more evidence to talk about antibiotics and to show that they are actually impose a serious issue on the health in general. Antibiotics or antibiotic resistance is not really a new um, uh, issue. It's rather, I, I, I think it's, it's decades now and it's an, always an old and new problem. And uh, I don't want to say that we are losing the battle against uh, stopping this issue of antibiotic resistance. I quoted this from the health, World Health Organization. And uh, again, there is a problem. I here have uh, highlighted the, uh, some of the bugs, actually, like pneumonia, um, salmonella, and others. And uh, well, we, we've seen that it, it, it's an issue with most uh, common diseases that we experience and face and be exposed to in, in it's not only in the Arab world, but actually in the whole, the whole world. Um, uh, I, I will, today here, I'm, I'm here to actually talk about, I'm not going to talk about antibiotic resistance, rather I'm going to talk about some of the solutions that could be used. Uh, this is from the National Academy of Medicine, and uh, well, um, to treat the diseases that uh, suffer or hit by, by antibiotic resistance, you can see bacteriophage actually is one of them. There's uh, many suggestions in this regard. So bacteriophage is one. Uh, also some other uh, methods, bacteriocin, predatory bacteria. There are, these, these are the specific ones, actually, the recent specific ones. But there are other general, like uh, competitive inclusion, etc. And uh, these are for treatment. Now, there are other suggestions for to prevent, actually like vaccines and immunotherapies, etc. I'm here to talk or highlight some of the um, issues rated in the, uh, or in, in the use of bacterial pages. That's, uh, the, that's the one I'm going to talk about. 
I'll give just general information about it and also show some of the work that we have done, uh, mostly at the Palestine Botanical University. I also did some work in, in Seoul, Hong Kong University, with some of my collaborate, collaborators and also with Europe. And uh, uh, actually, we were, uh, as you will see, it's, 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 a, it's a big issue. It's, it's not really an, an easy uh, issue, particularly. It's not in the isolating of bacteriophages, but rather in actually the clinical uh, trials and having to get uh, the use of these bacteriophage license or approved for the use in, in humans. Okay, so bacteriophage is not something that is new. It's actually way back in the 1896 19, uh, when um, Ernest Hankin noticed that the people in India thought that there were like a river apparently here and the people who drank actually from that river thought that the waters were holy waters you know in india everything is holy they have i don't know but but that's their culture okay with all my due respect but uh, they told him that uh, we noticed that actually people who are affected by uh, uh, cholera and some other uh, kind of um, diseases common diseases can actually get cured if they drink it from this water he referred to but he wasn't the one actually who first said, okay, these are viruses and these are bacteriophages. There were lots of work until maybe 1919, actually, when the first bacteriophage was addressed. I don't want to go into that background, but this is not really new. Now, when um, during the First World War and the Second World War between these, uh, there were, of course, the research. In fact, actually, you can actually, the whole research that was done before that is equivalent to research that was done after the Second World War. And with the introduction of antibiotics, all this research stopped. Okay, so, well, it, this is risky. You have to work on isolating bacteriophages. So why not? Now we have antibiotics that actually can, you can see the effect, it's uh, just Im immediately. So bacteriophage therapy, it's basically like using these phages, viruses, that can kill bacteria. Now, fortunately, wherever there is bacteria, there is a virus, okay? So actually they believe, some scientists believe that there are 10 to the power of 31 to 32 different kinds of viruses. So there is no distribution, though you, you just cannot any, uh, see this in any other organism. So you would expect then all these pathogens that are bacteria-based, they have actually viruses that can uh, basically eliminate them. So that's what is bacteriophage therapy, using these viruses, these phages, to eliminate and cure these diseases. Structure, well, I, I always told my students, if you've seen Apollo 11, I think, the movie Apollo 11, these, <laughs> these ships, they look like these viruses. It looks like Apollo, actually, even one of these series. I think Apollo 11, that, the, that, 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 that that's the movie. So it has capsid and then uh, genome which can be a dna or rna and then a tail and it comes just it's, it's try to drill to make a bore in the cell in the bacterial cell the host cell and then insert its dna then the dna can be integrated into the genome it can actually go into do two different at least two different uh phases of of its life uh, lytic or lysogenic, I, I don't want to go into that detail, but just to, to, to keep it track on time. So in Palestine, we have isolated actually over a half a dozen of these viruses, and some of them are for important, uh, like, like, well, since, since the first talk, actually, we've been hearing about the problems with the Klebsiella pneumonia, Pseudomonas arginosa. I, I know some people pronounce it arginosa, something like this. Salmonella, etc. Even avian pathogenic E. coli, pathogenic E. coli, and avian pathogenic E. coli, and some other, uh, and we, we published again over half a dozen. So the basics of fish, fish therapy is when you isolate. Of, I will talk about the advantages. They are quite specific. Actually, all fishes that were isolated were specific for their host, which is good in one way and bad in uh, some other ways. 
but they actually target the virus. You, they can multiply, so I don't need to give doses. And they infect the cell, and they took over its genome. They can, well, they can go either in light, glycine, it depends on the viruses. And eventually, you can actually get rid of these um, pathogens. So here, for example, this is a Pseudomonas arginosa phages. It's plated, seeded on the plate, and when you buy it, seven micrometers, it actually contains a small amount. You can see that the first day they make this zone, which is a plaque, it's a clear zone, so they kill all the bacteria. If you leave it more hours, then it starts to grow, 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 until it actually kills all. It will clear the whole plate. So that's something very good. So it can actually multiply by itself. Uh, which is an advantage. The same with the Clipsilla. These are images from uh, two different phages that we've actually I isolated in the university. Uh, now, well, whenever there is a virus, you have to determine a few things, actually, before you can take it to an next step. Uh, one of them is the host range. You, you need to see if they are specific or not. Uh, he here, we have the um, uh, Arginosa. Uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't touch E. coli, pathogenic E. coli, nor it do for the Clipsella pneumonia or the other. So it's it's fairly specific. I don't want, well, so it, it depends how you look at the whole issue, whether this is actually an advantage or a disadvantage. I don't want to go into that, but it's a specific. And sometimes when it comes to medicine, specificity is quite important. So that's actually something that is important. Uh, and some other characteristics that we need to determine is, uh, for example, uh, experiments like the uh, double layer test, which, which is needed to actually uh, tell something about how it grows, how it multiplies. Uh, this is a, a, one step, so it's, it looks like a step, actually. It's a triphasic event. You, you see that you infect, it takes time, something like 20, 24, then 25 start to rise. So it's like a step. That's the, that's the first one is the latent period. And then it actually, it goes kind of a linear before it starts to play two or levels off. Um, microbiologists see the same thing in, in bacteria, but bacteria have actually another phase, which is the decline or the death phase. So they, this one, no, they just start to multiply. As long as there is a host, they multiply. And even if there is no host, usually they don't actually die. So look here at the burst time. Burst is very important because this is where actually start to, to multiply in huge amounts in numbers. It's 50, 55 minutes. And for another one, we found that actually it's 10 hours. It's a big difference. So we thought about making a cocktail actually for bear and wound um, infections because unfortunately I just cannot take it to clinical trials because that's until now, it's not re really clear. It's not approved. I will show you where actually clinical trials were approved by the FDA and other countries. But well, you have still some room to play with, like for example, working with animal systems, it's, it's, etc. Having a cocktail of phages that target common pathogens, like all the ones I've seen in the today's lectures, were actually very common in the burn wound infections. So we thought, okay, making a semi-liquid paste that can be used externally in these wounds, and you have something that actually having its burst time very short, fairly short, and one in hours. And that means that you actually a continuous dose of different viruses to eliminate the infection. Um, genome, while well, mostly, they, they, are, they are small, actually. They are small, around 20... Uh, uh, KB, 20, 25. Uh, we also determined whether the, um, the, the genome time, for example, whether they are DNAs or RNAs, uh, mostly actually are, were very resistant to RNAs. Uh, that's an indication of having a DNA virus. Mo mo there are some actually RNA viruses, but it, mostly DNA, like the T, T series. T2, T4, etc. all are DNA viruses. Proteins, they don't appear to have many, um, uh, many proteins, maybe many molecules, but actually 
coming from a limited number of genes, actually, that encode these capsidy proteins, I would say they are uh, less than 10. It's very difficult on an SDS page to determine exactly how many, because sometimes you cannot see them. And I want to tell you something. It's not really fun to isolate virus genome, nor do virus proteins. You have to collect a huge amount to have something that you can barely see, okay? So approach is, well, you can use the phage intact or actually using part of it. We have cloned one of the proteins that we see as a promising. So instead of using the whole phage, we're just using components of, of it. Actually, I, I did one for the government and one of the research received the highest uh, award from the uh, high, high uh, it's the Council of Innovation, Majlis al-Ibda' al Palestine al-A'la. And I got actually the first prize of the best medical. 10,000 they gave me, actually. It's for you, not for the research. It's for me. Yeah, you have to your job. <laughs> but I divided 50% I divided for me and for my students, that's, to be honest. Yeah, well, I mean, they, they did the work. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the application of this phage or even lysine can actually be a series of, well, it's, it's now actually being expanded. We are heading towards the superbug. That's a, that's a fact. We, we're, we're, we're very close of having actually Pseudomonas by itself. Uh, um, it, it's, it, it's a BRD. It, it, it doesn't respond to most, to all, I, I would say to all antibiotics. Okay, so, well, there are advantages. It's actually, more, you, can, you can see these all advantages, but some of them are very, actually, they are specific. Low toxicity, auto-dosing, so you don't need to give, to, to give actually more than one dose, and they can multiply. Well, in a blade, actually, just you buy with a small amount of fish, we can actually count them. And then what they do, they start to multiply. As long as there is a host, then multiply. Um, and, uh, well, the, I, I don't want to see that there is actually a, a fully agreed or in, in relative to these, to these advantages. So there are some disadvantages. Still people think that it can actually can form some resistance. This is why moving to the component, viral component, you will, I, I, I would expect that actually we'll never see a disadvantage for this. But there are some, some disadvantages associated with it. I think I'm running out of time and, uh, uh, okay. What is slide like? Okay. So, um, I can actually, the, the next slide, this is why I, I advanced fairly quickly because I, I have here all the advantages and disadvantages of using whole bacteriophage versus using a component of it. You can see that they are some of the advantages that can actually uh, uh, contribute to this. Uh, that they are specific, natural, while well, they are in the environment. And even if you are used in the food, I don't know, Dr. Tarak is here, they don't actually affect the taste of the food or they, they, they don't. And uh, they are, I would say that they are fairly cheap to isolate. It's not like antibiotics. They take uh, time and the uh, resources. So you need time and resources. And you are always in a race with the bug itself because they kind of... Uh, modify their mechanism to, to neutralize these antibiotics. So that's uh, something uh, need to be uh, mentioned, I guess. How, how, how much I have? Okay. And uh, still, there, um, FDA, as, as we'll see, they're still not really sure if we can actually, like, well, there is a concern. There is a concern. I, I will come to it. So clinical trials, well, I actually managed to get the clinical trials that we have. Again, the FDA is the major, uh, I don't want to say barrier or um, they, 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 they actually promote the use of, of, of bacteriophages, but they are very careful. Well, whether to use single uh, or cocktail, etc. I'm actually developing a cocktail in a beast. So use, to, to be used externally, and we'll see what, what's going to happen later. But you can see that actually there are in many places in different countries, 
And if you look at the last one, it's actually started in February 2021. They approved uh, the use of um, basically a, a phage in a clinical trial, and they, uh, they expect that this will be ready this year in October, um, okay, in, in Mayo Clinic. So you can see, like if you go back actually a few years ago, FDA never ever allowed this to happen. Now, well, they are more lenient and they are actually, they, they, they know that, well, I mean, they are at top, the top of, <laughs> you are in pharmacy and you know, well, they, they are the top agency basically in this regard. So clinical trials start to basically move. So it's uh, on the go, different countries. There are many companies, of course, now they have actually phages that, okay, sure, sure. Yeah, they have actually, and they start to use it. Uh, I would say that Georgia in East Europe, I think, Georgia, they, they, they are the first actually to start to commercialize this. Others in UK, uh, even now in the USA and different countries. Well, to finish up, it's still, it's a long way. It's actually, I would say that uh, solution to the antibiotic, I, I would like to read what, what, what I mentioned here. Solutions to the antibiotic resistance problem are multifaceted and include reducing the use of antibiotics. And I think you, you hear the talks in the, the, in, in the morning, but there is no one single alternative solution to replace the use of antibiotics uh, because a variety of specific and general methods are needed to basically both prevent and treat disease. So it's a, it's a, it's a long way and it's one of the ways suggested. Uh, that's for the, uh, for the, uh, the future. I, I, I think we will start to see from here maybe to 10 years to come that there is a decrease in the use and dependence on antibiotics but on the other hand, there is actually an increase in the use of antibiotics. And I would like to thank uh, many, many students actually and colleagues uh, for their help and the World Bank and many other research grants, but uh, mainly supported by the World Bank Quality Improvement Fund. And uh, with this, I, I stop and I thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank awesome. you, yes, thank you, Dr. Fozzi. We'll ask to write uh, to join us here for questions. Uh, me, yeah, Dr. Fozzi. Uh, Dr. Raid, sorry. Dr. Raid, still with us, or here with us. We'll take uh, the advantage, since I'm here, the moderator of this session, I will ask a question before you. <laughs> yes, yes, I'll ask a question before you. Uh, Dr. Fozzi, do you think uh, if there are any studies uh, conducted in coronavirus and phages? Coronavirus, it's a virus. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Good one. Okay. And I. Uh, <laughs> it's not bacteria. Good yeah, it's not. Also, <laughs> oh, you're okay. kicking me. <laughs> okay. Uh, wow. Yes. Thank you, Dr. You are brave. Really, you are great. You are tackling the problem, which is really a lot of risks. Wow. So, you may spend hundreds of years, thousands of students, without getting a result. So, you are really great that you are still continuing doing this approach. Okay. The problem that, you know, why the FDA is, you know, putting a big barrier for this, these approaches of, of bacteriophages and phages therapy. Mm -hmm. Is that they are afraid of the co-evolutionary effects yes. between two different bacteria. We know that the transduction process between you know bacteria is sometimes managed by the phages. So they are transporting genes from one bacteria to another, and they are also contributing to the accumulative problem of resistance of bacteria. So that you have to kiss hundreds of frogs before you catch your friends. And I think it's not an easy way to tackle this problem. This is number one. Number two, congratulate you for this, for the top of the researchers in Palestine. But I would strongly recommend that you test these pages on a human fibroblast cells so that you are, you know, very specific that they are not attacking the human cells since they are, you know, binding to the CD4 and CD8, I think, uh, receptors on the macrophages. I'm really afraid that you will, at the end of the day, end up with no results. But you are a brave man. I still have no You mean when you move to the in vivo? 
Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I um, uh, well, I try to go to your first question first. I absolutely agree with you, and I uh, you you know that FDA uh, was very concerned about giving any approvals, even for clinical trials, but they start to do. They start to do. And you can actually see that they have actually provided several approvals. You know, they are not rigid, FDA, and you've, you've seen what happened during the COVID-19. They gave actually emergency kind of approvals, but for fish therapy, they did. They start actually to do. And, you know, I worked for a long time with viruses and I used them actually as a vehicle for transformation. I have, I have the biggest library in the area that actually I managed, you know, I, I, I just put them in my bag, actually, all these glass. And, and yeah, I, well, I, I, they, they told me that you will be arrested one, one day, you know, in, but uh, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. So I know that this is actually a possible issue. Okay, but it's actually FDA is now an open minded. It's not an FDA five years ago. That, that's one. And for the second question, we actually tried and we looked at some of the phages that uh, are, I would say, agriculturally important, like Salmonella, uh, avian E. coli, and we actually uh, tried to use it on lock in poultry, and I have now a farm where they provided some, and we are kind of in a, in a process to initiate, to infect, infect these uh, poultry chicken with Salmonella and just use it to treat them and see what happens. So this is actually, the, it, it's, it's, it's a kind of a, in a process, or it's, it, it's in the final stages of the design to start this. And uh, well, we'll see what's going to happen. If, if you allow me to comment on what the Dr. Posey mentioned, yes, I agree. Actually, in, uh, before 15 years ago, uh, many studies were conducted on the University of Arkansas mm -hmm. on pages to combat uh, Salmonella. They give uh, the viruses. To it's commercially yes. available now. And uh, actually, one of my students is working currently on pages to uh, eliminate pathogenic microorganisms uh, on uh, vegetables. Uh, many studies were conducted uh, also in food applications, actually, yeah. to, uh, to uh, control and eliminate uh, E. coli, Salmonella, Campylobacter on carcasses, either like. Uh, animal or uh, poultry. Uh, we'll go to the next question. Yes. Thank you so much, Mr. Posey, for a very nice uh, presentation. And, uh, uh, Larry Adler uh, is almost facing this problem with the animal and the natural food. The problem of standardization, when you're thinking about it, it's okay, abroad, uh, it will be a long journey to be abroad, but you know the standardization of this such child treatment, I think, it's so difficult. Okay, I think, uh, generally speaking, it will be way easier than working with antibiotics. And even for the dosing, it's actually a single dose and you just forget it because they multiply. Yeah, yeah, yeah they mu multiply. In relative to cost, it's, uh, it's very cheap. Actually, uh, well, for, for me, the first, I, 12 years ago, I treated the first fish and it was costly. The second one, and now I can actually isolate it in very, compared to antibiotic or working with antibiotics, and it's way, way cheap. It's, it's not actually, in, in fact, there are some people say that, well, there is a, a pressure actually on the FDA. I don't want to go into these issues, but because the because the pharmaceutical companies, it's not actually of their interest to use phages. But uh, but I, I I think it's easier than working with antibiotics. No one asked me about the source of these phages. I collected these actually from the hospital waste and sewage system because you find all bacteria in the city there. So it's actually, I can tell you that you can find a phage for every single pathogen. 
So we originally actually, well, I mean, bacteria is there. Like imagine in a city where they dump everything in the city. So you would find all the cocktail of bacteria and pathogens in the sewage. So this is from where actually we collected the viruses. Uh, last question. Yes, please. Uh, thank you for this uh, nice talk. My question is uh, in talking about the species. How specific they are? There is no potential to with uh, normal product. Um, we actually tested, uh, normally we test on not less than 10 different strains and not even closely related strains. And we found them to be very specific in this regard. But sometimes for the cousin strains, they can actually eliminate. Like in E. coli, we found E. coli, Shirisha uh, E. coli, they can actually, we have isolates and strains, many, we got it from different hospitals. Uh, the same phage tended to eliminate all of them. But when you tested on Salmonella, for example, and or uh, Bacillus cirrus, or any other uh, uh, strains that we got at that time, actually were very specific. They just did not do anything. I, um, Dr. Ahmad suggested using a human cells or something like this. We have actually some, uh, cells, but I never thought <laughs> of using this. Uh, I would expect that, well, I mean, uh, looking at the prokaryotic and the eukaryotic, I, I think it will still be specific. I haven't actually done such work, but I expect they are very specific. Yes. Because, uh, you, you know, biochemically, and if you look at the, it, it's, a, it's a long issue, but biochemically, you would expect that actually they target a receptor that is very conserved in a single strain, bacteria. This is why they are specific. Okay, uh, I have a second question. Regarding the fate of this particular fate, if you use them, because um, one of your slides Yeah, you, you are correct. Actually, this is the same, one of the concerns of the FDA. What's going to happen with all of these phages once? Well, I mean, we are exposed. I mean, I would expect there is maybe thousands of different phages in our body here in everyone's yeah. bodies. So they are in from the environment. They are actually natural from the environment. And they tend to, to keep just dormant. What next? Well, I mean, if they don't touch my cells, I don't care if they stay <laughs> in, my, in my body. I mean, well, that, that's the, the way. But we cannot tell, actually, what's the fate. Yes, I think more studies uh, actually are needed to uh, get the approval and yani, to use yeah. uh, phages uh, as a way to uh, control pathogenic microorganisms in, in human. Thank you, Dr. Fauzi. Okay. Thank you for uh, the audience. Uh, now, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Yunus, but actually uh, he couldn't make it and uh, come. So we'll uh, move to our next speaker will be Dr. Maha Nasser. Dr. Amah Nasser is an uh, active member in, in Agia. Uh, she is a professor at Ain Shams University in Egypt. Uh, Dr. Fozzi talked about uh, phages. So now Dr. Amah will talk about uh, nanotechnology. We'll see if this is a promising technology. The answer, yes. We'll see now. Floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Maha Nasser. I'm professor of uh, pharmaceutics and industrial pharmacy at the Faculty of Pharmacy in Shams University in Egypt. 
Um, I'm very delighted by the kind invitation of Institute Pasteur. Um, it's my first time here in Tunisia and definitely not my last time. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the nanotechnology as a possible solution for um, antibiotic resistance. Let me emphasize that I'm not a microbiology specialist, I'm a delivery specialist. So how can nanotechnology be of use in tackling the problem of antibiotic resistance? This is the question that I'm going to answer through my presentation. My presentation is very concise. I'm going to give highlights on two of our published research in this regard, and then I'll be happy to take any further questions. So basically why I entered this area of nanotechnology and nanomedicine, because simply I'm a pharmacist by education, and I do believe in the power of nanotechnology. In the area of the drugs and in the area of medicine, nanotechnology has very potential, uh, great potential to lower the side effects of the drugs, to reduce the treatment costs, and this is a very important aspect, to increase the patient compliance. For example, if you're going to tell the patient to take a drug every like four hours or six hours, with nanotechnology, you can give the drug once a week, for example. Also, you can alter the pharmaceutical properties of the drug, therefore you can improve its bioavailability, its pharmacokinetic properties, and hence its therapeutic efficacy. So, I come to the next slide because whenever many people hear about nanotechnology, they say, oh my God, nanoparticles are toxic. So, let me emphasize that there are several types of nanoparticles, and mostly the nanoparticles which are toxic are mostly the inorganic types. Even, for example, the silver nanoparticles, the metal oxide, the gold nanoparticles, they are yielding promising results, but there are concerns regarding their safety. That's why I'm really biased to the first type, which is the organic type, the vesicular type, especially the liposomes. Dr. Mohamed Al Hadidi has mentioned some of the nanoparticles that I'm really working on. So the vesicular particles are mainly made of phospholipids, which are natural uh, materials found in the body, so they are very safe. Also, the emulsions, which is simply oil, water, surfactant, you can solubilize so many drugs in them, and they have also high safety profile. In addition to other polymeric nanoparticles, for example, the chitosan nanoparticles are very promising, and stuff like that. So basically, nanoparticles, not all of the nanoparticles are safe, and not all of them are toxic. So we are talking about the good type of nanoparticle, which is the ones which are safe and efficacious. And even in the market now, you can find so many nanoparticle-based products which are approved mainly for cancer treatment and other stuff, but there are actually, in the market, you can find so many products based on nanotechnology. So, basically, I'm going to focus on two types of nanoparticles that I'm working on. The first type is the nanoemulsion. And let me emphasize that we are doing so many pre preliminary work in order to reach one optimized formulation. For example, we have to test so many compositions between oil, surfactant, and water in order to yield good nanoparticles. And then we characterize these nanoparticles and we test whether they can solubilize the drugs or not. So behind each optimized formulation, you can find so many years of hard work in order to yield just this formulation. So basically for the um, nano emulsion part, we do the optimization with the oil, water, surfactant. And this is a picture of the nanoparticle because some of you are not familiar with its shape. It's very like, it's, it's a liquid. Some of them are solids, but you can see it's like the very transparent liquid. And under the transmission microscope, you can see the cute little dots under the transmission microscope. These are the nanoparticles. They are very, very small. That's why you can't see them with the ordinary microscope. You need the scanning or the transmission electron microscope to be visualized. The second type of nanoparticle, which is the liposomes, and of course liposomes have so many derivatives. Some of them are elastic, some of them contain penetration enhancers, so you can find so many generations. So when we say liposomes, basically they are formed of phospholipids, which are natural components in the body. And they have a very um, nice feature, is that the phospholipids, they tend, when they are placed in aqueous phase, they tend to form spherical vesicles. If you can see the coat of the spherical vesicles, it's lipidic in nature, phospholipids, so you can solubilize so many hydrophobic drugs inside them. Of course, we can categorize the drugs. Some of them are hydrophilic, some of them are hydrophobic. 
So the liposomes, it can carry both because the outer layer is lipidic and then the inner layer is aqueous. So you can actually load in this, it's not hollow, the aqueous core inside, it's actually aqueous. It has a liquid in it, for example, buffer or water or whatever. So you can actually load hydrophilic drugs inside the core of the nano uh, liposomes. And as you can see also the picture in that under the transmission electron microscope, you can evidently see the core and the coat structure of the liposomes. These two are my favorites. And now I'm going to show you the published research on, in, in the area of the antibiotic resistance related to these nanoparticles. So firstly, before I display the research, how can nanotechnology benefit the problem of antibiotic resistance? As we have encountered in the previous uh, presentations, you can uh, obviously see that you have problem in accessing the bacteria. Firstly, if, for example, the bacteria, you can't penetrate the bacterial wall or the bacterial membrane, then you can't get efficacy for the drug. So with the nanoparticles, you can actually help to penetrate this bacterial cell wall or the bacterial membrane. A second mechanism is that the microorganisms, they can develop the efflux pumps, which they um, expel, expel the antibiotic outside. So you need to get it inside back. So some of the nanoparticles can actually inhibit these efflux pumps. Another mechanism is that the microorganisms, they can release enzymes which degrade the antibiotic. But if you are encapsulating the antibiotic inside the nanoparticle, then it can be stabilized against degradation by these enzymes. And finally, some of the microorganisms, they tend to form the biofilm that you have encountered in the previous uh, lectures. So nanoparticles can actually penetrate this bacterial biofilm and overcome the bacteria, especially the ones which are residing at the end of the biofilm. And we will see that right now with the uh, published research. So the first paper, in this paper, we have actually loaded three types of antibiotics. Of course, with the work, the collaborative work of Dr. Mohammed Al Hadidi, we are testing natural products. So what about the actual antibiotics? For example, the clindamycin, the lenizolib, the uh, doxycycline, for example. These are antibiotics which are actually, they are approved and in the market, but then suddenly they are as good as dead. They are not effective anymore against the strains. So what if we can use the nanoparticles to revive them from the dead? What, how can we use the, we can also make use now of the, nano, uh, of the antibiotics, which are now not of use on the bacteria, just you load them in the nanoparticles and then they become of use again. So what we did in this paper is that we have isolated the resistant strains from the blood of patients from uh, several hospitals in Egypt. And then we have tested whether these uh, strains, they can form biofilms or not. And then we have isolated the strong biofilm formers and we have tested these three antibiotics on these biofilm forming strains. We found that they are 100% resistant. So when we loaded them in the nanoparticles, the nano emulsions, they immediately increased the susceptibility of these bacterial strains to the antibiotics. You can see this in the table now. But then comes the next question. Okay, they are effective now against the bacteria, but what about the safety? So the first issue that we had to check is that we need to check the safety of these nanobiotics on normal cells. So as you can see, interestingly, we were very happy with this finding is that the viability of the cells when we tested the antibiotics not loaded in the nanoparticles, they were more toxic than the antibiotics which were loaded in the nanoparticles. So a very nice finding is that the nanoparticles, they can increase actually the safety of the antibiotics, not the reverse. And then secondly, what about the efficacy? So we just tested the minimum biofilm inhibitory concentrations. So as you can see, the four strains that we have tested, they are strong biofilm formers. They are 100% resistant to the three antibiotics, but then when they are loaded in the nanobiotics, you can see that the sensitivity, the S percent increased when we loaded the antibiotics inside the nanoparticles. So this shows us that the inclusion of the antibiotics in nanoparticles can increase the therapeutic safety without compromising, the increase the therapeutic efficacy without compromising the safety. It even increased the safety of the antibiotics on normal cells. So we were really happy with the findings of the results, but then because I'm a pharmacist, we said, okay, why don't we test 
how we can apply this to the dosing frequency on the patients. So in the next uh, paper, I will come to the biofilm uh, slide later. So in the next paper, we were testing something called the post-antibiotic effect. Basically, what's the post-antibiotic effect? It gives you an indication when you remove the antibiotic from the medium of the bacteria, how long it would take the bacteria to grow. So if you prolong this time, it means that the treatment that you gave the bacteria is actually effective because it suppressed the growth of the bacteria for a long time. So we compared the post-antibiotic effect of the antibiotics not loaded in nanoparticles and those loaded with nanoparticles to see if the ones loaded in nanoparticles, they are going to prolong the effect after the removal of the antibiotics. So we have isolated two MRSA strains from uh, also the patients from um, Egyptian hospitals. And we tested the susceptibility. Of course, you can see here the minimum inhibitory concentration. When we load the antibiotics inside the nanoparticles, it just decreased because it increases the activity on these strains. And then the post-antibiotic effects, we have noticed that the loading of the antibiotics inside the nanoparticles prolonged this post-antibiotic effects. For example, which when we want to translate this into medicine, we can say simply that instead of giving the patient an antibiotic and, take, and asking him to take it every four hours, every six hours, you can prolong the time if you give this antibiotic inside a nanoparticle. So you are here decreasing the dosing frequency, you are increasing the duration of the dosage, and hence you are lessening the side effects on the patient. So we are also happy with these results because simply you can just translate that into actual clinical efficacy on the patients. So let me show you an illustration. Um, okay. So in order for you to visualize how the nanoparticles can work, you see these yellow particles at the left of the slides. These are the antibiotic particles, the poor antibiotic particles that when they penetrate the biofilm, they are just trapped. They cannot reach the bacteria, which is orange in color in here, because they are just trapped in this biofilm matrix. But what about the nanoparticles? The nanoparticles, the purple ones, even if you just um, surfacely absorb the drug on the surface of the nanoparticles or you encapsulate the drug inside, the nanoparticles have the ability to penetrate. And even now there are generations of these nanoparticles which can be elastic enough to reach deeply the bacteria which are residing, some of they call them the persistors, which are residing at the end of the biofilm and they can tackle these bacteria and they can penetrate deep inside and then they can overcome the biofilm. So you can see the happy results of the destruction of the bacteria and the biofilm. So to conclude, what's my take home message is that antibiotics, when they are loaded in the nanosystems, they exhibit higher therapeutic efficacy. Not just that, they can increase actually the safety of the existing antibiotics and they are prolonging the post-antibiotic effects. They are much more effective than the mere antibiotics. So I would like to thank my funders. On top of them is Agia for funding my work on the drug delivery. I'm not just focused on drug delivery for antibiotic resistance. I'm mainly also working on cancer treatment and uh, dermatological diseases as well. And I would like to thank my funders. And I would also like to welcome you to Egypt. I know most of you are familiar with Egypt as Cairo, the capital. So if you have seen only Cairo, you haven't seen Egypt. I would like to invite you to come to Aswan, which is a small city in the south of Egypt. This is an actual, this is not a Photoshop uh, picture. You can see the picture of the Nile. And this is Aswan on both sides of the Nile. And the sunset in the night is just amazing. So I'd like to welcome you all to visit Egypt. And I'm now happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Okay. Yes. Okay.
נהפכו כמנהג הסוף. Last but not least, I would like to invite Dr. Hanen Tiuri and thank her very much for being uh, with us because she was invited at the last minute. Sorry, please, could you hear me? Dr. Hanen Tiuri, it's our pleasure to welcome you here. And uh, it was supposed, you can see in the program, Dr. Salma Zarguni, but unfortunately, she has an accident. So uh, I would like to thank Dr. Hanen Tiuri for being able to give this talk despite being contacted at the last minute. And uh, thank you so much. Merci thank you Uh, thank you, Dr. Masson. Uh, I am sorry Please. for our guest. I am going to speak in French because, uh, as Dr. Masson said, uh, I have been uh, invited very late. So I am going to, uh, I, uh, I translated the text of some slides and some titles for our uh, English speaker uh, uh, guests, okay? Donc, il m'a été demandé... Camera, qui t'en... Il m'a été demandé... Est-ce que vous m'entendez? You hear me? No. Yeah, allez. Et c'est la raison pour laquelle je suis là pour vous relater un petit peu le plan qui a été élaboré en Tunisie avec la participation Il y a eu même des, des, des étudiants en médecine, en pharmacie, des vétérinaires. Euh, donc c'est la raison pour laquelle on parle d'une seule santé, de votre mère. Donc euh, c'était une multidisciplinaire. Et euh, vous savez très bien que de par le monde, euh, on sait que l'OMS a classé cette, euh, ce programme de l'antibiodistance parmi les dix menaces mondiales de santé. Donc, c'est dire que c'est vraiment un très très gros problème. Alors, par rapport à ça, pourquoi cette antibiodistance Eh bien, vous savez que d'une part, il y a un usage, euh, un usage des antibiotiques. Tout le monde prescrit des antibiotiques, à tort et à travers. Dans le monde animal, pareil, c'est une utilisation de prescription d'antibiotiques à tort et à travers. Et donc, tout ça a fait que, et d'un autre côté, n'oubliez pas que dans les milieux de soins, malheureusement, on ne fait pas attention aux mesures de prévention contre les infections associées aux soins, contre la fabrication de ces germes, etc. Le résultat est là. Nous avons des infections associées aux soins, euh, nous avons des, des hospitalisations qui sont longues, nous avons une qualité de vie avec des séquelles, etc. qui sont là, et en plus, il y a un impact économique très très important. Donc, voilà pourquoi euh, on parle aujourd'hui de ce plan de résistance. Je ne vais pas trop m'attarder là-dessus, vous avez bien compris, il y a un lien entre l'animal, l'environnement, l'homme, donc, euh, la résistance est là, la dissémination de ce germe qui devient résistant, en fait, il n'y a, a plus de frontières, et c'est la raison pour laquelle, quand le plan a été établi, c'était un plan qui a réuni tout le monde, tout ce qu'on monde, les vétérinaires, euh, la, la DHMPE, les médecins, les pharmaciens, les microbiologistes, les vétérinaires, etc. Donc, et c'est la raison pour laquelle, dans ce, dans ce slide, j'ai dit que nous sommes tous dans la même galère. 
donc les animaux nous-mêmes et comme vous le voyez dans, euh, dans cette slide. Alors, en Tunisie, et je remercie le professeur Feuchet, mais je crois qu'elle vous a donné une idée un petit peu sur la résistance bactérienne, et là, on a un énorme problème de résistance bactérienne. Alors, euh, moi qui suis clinicienne, problème qui se pose, c'est qu'on a même maintenant des BLSE en milieu communautaire. Où est-ce qu'on va Donc, le problème est là, c'est surtout avec les bacilles à grande médiatique. Heureusement que par rapport au COXI, on est encore dans une zone quand même de confort, mais c'est le, le peu de, de menacement très augmenté. Euh, problème, comme je l'ai dit, en milieu communautaire, on a encore, on commence à avoir des BLSE et ça, ça pose problème. Et euh, j'étais en train de parler avec le professeur Pelgen, même au niveau des aussi, on a des anthropologues de, de fission, la résistance euh, qui, qui est en train de demander aussi. Donc, alors dans le milieu animal, ce n'est pas mon domaine, mais comme euh, quand on est en train de préparer le plan, on a beaucoup discuté avec euh, les vétérinaires, et je remercie le professeur Miganes, et j'aurais souhaité qu'elle soit parmi nous. Euh, on, on a des données que je vais vous. J'ai pris juste deux slides pour vous donner un petit peu une idée sur ce qui se passe en milieu vétérinaire. Chez les animaux, comment ça se passe Est-ce que ça va de pair avec les données euh, humaines ou, euh, ou, ou ce n'est pas le cas Et là, je veux dire que quand je vais montrer ces deux slides, il y a un, vraiment un lien étroit entre ces résistances des bacilles à grand négatifs qui sont très très importantes et ces résistances des coccyx qui restent quand même assez basses. Malheureusement, au milieu euh, vétérinaire, il n'y a pas assez de laboratoire, on n'a pas assez de données, et les données que je vais vous montrer, c'est des données un petit peu éparses, des données euh, euh, essentiellement de master, des prospectives, etc., à la faculté, euh, tout simplement. Voilà un petit peu des données des chéris dit dans la chair de poulet. Regardez ce, 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 ce taux de BLSE qui varie entre... Euh, de 18, 12, et qui arrive jusqu'à 30%. C'est énorme. C'est énorme, chez les chocolats. Et ça rejoint un petit peu le taux de, 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 de BLSE euh, chez l'homme. Les chez les chocolats, je suppose que vous êtes d'accord avec moi, pour des sortes de génie, c'est que le, le, les BLSE, pareil, le, le pourcentage est en train d'augmenter. Alors, en médecine vétérinaire, alors pour les staffs métiers résistants, ça n'est pas le même problème que les bacilles à négatifs. Ça varie entre 0 et 3,9%. Et là, ce sont plusieurs études et je vous apporte ici les résultats. Alors, qu'est-ce qu'on peut dire par rapport à la santé animale Malheureusement, euh, c'est vrai que ça, c'est résistant qui sont en train d'augmenter. Malheureusement, on n'a pas assez de laboratoires et les vétérinaires se plaignent. Quand on compare ça au laboratoire humain, Malheureusement, il n'y a pas assez de laboratoire. Euh, en plus, il y a cet usage des antibiotiques dans les vaches. Malheureusement, c'est en train de se faire. Il y a une vente illicite d'antibiotiques de, 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 de fournisseurs carrément aux éleveurs. Donc, tout ça, ça pose problème. Il n'y a pas de contrôle des ventes. Il n'y a aucun contrôle des ventes. Et les vétérinaires s'en plaignent. Et il n'y a pas de programme de suivi de la résistance matérielle en milieu euh, animal. Euh, on, on, je me suis dit, donc il y a des résistances, est-ce qu'il y a un parallèle avec l'utilisation d'antibiotiques Puisqu'on dit que, on dit que euh, le résultat des antibiotiques, ou encore la surutilisation d'antibiotiques, va entraîner une augmentation des résistances bactériennes. Et bien, vous allez voir que nous sommes des champions en usage en, en, en matière de, de consommation d'antibiotiques. Et là, c'est une étude que j'ai empruntée au docteur Samir Hatomi de la TPM. Alors, vous voyez que. Je ne sais pas si vous voyez là, en Tunisie, c'est le bleu. Alors, vous voyez qu'on est des champions en utilisant des on, on se rapproche un petit peu de la Grèce, qui est le mauvais élève de l'Europe. Donc, euh, on est de gros consommateurs, mais on consomme pratiquement trois fois plus que la Hollande. Là, on est Pays-Bas qui sont le meilleur élève en fait en, en Europe. Et, quand même, une fois et demie, ce que consomme la France. Donc, c'est énorme. Donc, on est de gros consommateurs. On a beaucoup de résistance. Et ça s'explique parce qu'on est de gros consommateurs d'antibiotiques. Euh, euh, pour des carbapénèmes, j'ai choisi les carbapénèmes. Et bien là aussi, on consomme beaucoup de carbapénèmes. Vous allez me dire, c'est normal, avec ces BLSE qui sont en train d'augmenter, on va se rabattre sur ces carbapénèmes. Donc la situation est là, on consomme beaucoup d'antibiotiques, on a beaucoup de résistance. 
Alors, c'est la raison pour laquelle, en Tunisie, et grâce essentiellement euh, à l'apport euh, de l'OMS, mais aussi l'OIE, la FAO, on a établi un plan, qui a, ça a pris pres presque deux ans, et qui a été euh, signé par Madame la Ministre le 7 septembre de 2019. Alors, il y a eu quatre objectifs, c'est le, je dirais, c'est le sujet euh, de, de ma présentation. Ce plan, ces quatre objectifs, bon, et le cinquième objectif, c'est euh, euh, essentiellement, je n'en parlerai pas beaucoup parce que c'est essentiellement euh, la, 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 la fabrication de médicaments, le vaccin, etc. Donc, on va essentiellement nous, nous, nous concentrer sur les quatre objectifs. Alors, le premier axe, que moi, je ne suis pas d'accord avec le docteur Mansour, c'est un axe très, très, très important, c'est la sensibilisation. Quand vous voyez le taux d'automédication, c'est effarant. Donc, la sensibilisation, donc, la sensibilisation, il faut essayer d'apprendre aux gens ce que c'est la partie grâce à quoi Grâce à une bonne communication par la grand public, mais aussi le personnel médical, paramédical, une bonne éducation et un bon training, donc une bonne formation. Alors, voilà les éléments de cette... Euh, alors, le premier objectif, donc je parle du, de l'axe premier, c'est quand même euh, essayer de une sensibilisation et une bonne communication à propos des antibiotiques et à propos des effets secondaires de ces antibiotiques, entre autres la résistance microbienne. Alors, parmi les interventions stratégiques, il y a le grand public, et ça c'est très très important, parce qu'il faut partir de là, c'est le grand public qui, qui se, malheureusement s'approvisionne en antibiotiques à droite et à gauche chez le pharmacien, euh, la, la petite boîte d'antibiotiques qui, qui est là, qui reste, je suis je suis pharmacien, donc tout ça c'est important, et donc c'est très important, mais aussi la sensibilisation des intervenants en santé animale, en santé publique. En tout ça, c'est le conseil médical et le médical, le conseil vétérinaire et les efforts aussi auxquels il faut s'adresser. Pour les dissuader sur l'utilisation des entreprises. Le deuxième objectif est toujours dans ce premier On a même été euh, euh, ambitieux. On s'est dit pourquoi pas dès le scolaire 